started. I hope you felt welcomed tonight by uh, Chief of our Fire Department, Richard Seavers. Also, our Information Technology Manager, Ned Huta. They were our greeters this evening. Uh, it's just a little after 7 on February 19th, 2019. This is the regular City Commission meeting for the City of Ormond Beach, and we are in chambers this evening. I'd like to introduce the uh, staff who are sitting up in front of you. To my right, your left, Wendy Nichols, our recording secretary. City Clerk, Lisa Dame. Deputy Mayor and Zone 2 Commissioner, Troy Kent. To my left and your right, Commissioner from Zone 3, Susan Persis. Commissioner from Zone 4, Rob Littleton. Our City Manager, Joyce Shanahan. Assistant City Manager, Claire Whitley. City Attorney, Randy Hayes. And for those of you listening online, I'm Mayor Bill Partington. Uh, we're lucky to have Pastor Ben Brown with us this evening from Tomoka Christian Church. He's going to provide the invocation, if you would please rise for that, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening to the Mayor and the distinguished staff. Would everyone please bow your heads and uh, close your eyes. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for giving us this incredible opportunity to be your servants. Allow these great minds and great people tonight to continue to serve the great people that they represent. Bless this meeting. Bless every activity. Let your hand be upon us all as you guide us into understanding exactly who you are and what you desire of us. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. And all those who agree with the prayer said amen. Amen. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'll ask Officer uh, Long and Officer Hanson Ald to come forward. Cameron and Austin. This is a, uh, a great story with great ending and it just makes me so proud of our community uh, to be able to recognize these two young men um, and let me ask you to hold these while I read it to you I'm going to read the proclamation because it basically tells the story sorry about that whereas on December 25th 2018, Christmas Day, while on routine patrol, Officer Cameron Hanson Ald encountered an individual who was down on his luck and considering suicide. Officer Hanson Ald called for additional officers and started a dialogue with the distraught individual. Whereas Officer Austin Long responded to the scene and both officers were able to safely take the individual into protective custody. Once the individual was safe and secure, these two officers not only did their jobs, but went far and above what was required of them. And whereas during conversations with the individual, the officers showed an extraordinary amount of compassion and kindness. They learned that this person had recently switched jobs would be unable to pay his rent when it was due and was fearful of eviction from his home. The officers pooled their money together and ensured the individual had enough money to pay his rent. And whereas this extraordinary act of kindness and selfless display of compassion by these officers to a citizen in crisis 
are what make all of us proud to be residents of Ormond Beach. Now, therefore, I, Bill Partington, on behalf of the entire commission, do hereby proclaim today, February 19th, 2019, as a day to recognize Officer Cameron Hanson Ald and Officer Austin Long in the city and urge all residents to join me this day in paying tribute to the heroic officers for their outstanding display of kindness and compassion in assisting the public. Congratulations. Additionally, guys, I want to give you a key to the city of Ormond Beach. Each. I'll get you all loaded up here. And that'll be home on your uh, dresser or nightstand or wherever you want to keep it, a special place over the mantle, but also a smaller key to the city pin that you can wear out and about. So thank you, guys. You represent the best. That's about as good as it gets, honestly. You can't ask for, ask for better than that. It's uh, real life, and uh, Chief, your guys, they just did the right thing and, and made us all proud, so thank you. At this time, uh, we have a presentation. It's a uh, annual audit presentation presented by uh, James Moore and Company, and we have uh, partner Mike Sibley with us to make that presentation. Mike. Good evening. Is it your birthday today? <sighs> Try to. Happy birthday. Thanks. Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Our gift will be that we're not going to sing to you. But. We're not. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> well, good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Sibley. I'm a partner with James Moore and Company. We are your independent CPA firm that performs the annual audit. I'm stepping in tonight for Zach Shalfour, as you all know. Uh, who is uh, actually presenting in another city tonight. So uh, um, we are tasked each year with auditing the comprehensive annual financial report prepared by management uh, to determine, to make sure that it's accurate in all material respects. And as you know, it's a, quite a thick document. And I think before getting into it, just briefly, it's worth pointing out that the city for, la for 27 consecutive years has received the uh, Government Finance Officers Association's uh, Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting, which is not an easy task. It's uh, very, uh, it's, it's a lot of work. It's tedious work to go through and prepare this, considering all the, the standards uh, and new standards that have to be in compliance with it and the extra things. So I expect that, again, this year they'll receive that certificate. So uh, along those lines, I'd like to thank uh, Kelly McGuire and her staff for all their work during the audit. It's a it's a, it's a tremendous process to go through, so thank you guys for that help. Uh, there, there are main, there, out of the nearly 200 p pages, there are just a few reports in here that actually we put in there to uh, document the audit process. The first is the actual audit report, and we have given what's called an unmodified opinion, which means these financial statements are considered to be correct in all material respects. It's a clean opinion. It's what you're looking for. Uh, in addition to that, because you've spent uh, a, a, uh, over 750000 in federal funds, you also go through what's called a single audit, a federal single audit, and uh, we do specific compliance uh, audit relate to, relating to that. In this particular case, it revolved around the hurricane money spent this year. Uh, again, no compliance findings in that case. Um, 
Additionally, we are tasked with understanding your internal controls. We have to evaluate those controls. If we see any issues with them, we have to note them. We saw no instances of noncompliance with internal controls or weaknesses in, inter in your internal control policies. <clears throat> the Auditor General also requires a number of things that we look at. Uh, there were no instances of issues with uh, the number of the areas that they want us to look at. We did have one budgetary compliance issue. Uh, we considered a relatively minor issue considering it was the relating to a timing issue around the expenditure uh, for equipment. It was approved by you. It was just a timing issue and when the expense hit. Uh, management's aware of it. Uh, I don't expect that that'll be an issue in the future. Finally, we have a report on your compliance with your investment policies. Uh, we found no instances of non-compliance with your investment policies. Uh, we'll just hit a couple of the key highlights. Uh, we've been able to previously meet with several of you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So we've gone through the vast the, the, the details of this report. Uh, so again, we'll just hit the highlights. Some of the significant items, obviously, hurricanes a couple years in a row, a lot of funds expended in, in that uh, cleanup effort and the, other, the damage that ensued from that, nearly $11 million. Uh, Five and a half million this past year was part of our single audit. We expect there will be more testing as FEMA and the state of Florida approve the ability to have more expenditures come through and be reimbursed. Uh, you do have about $3.2 million outstanding currently with uh, FEMA to be reimbursed. A uh, significant amount, but the vast majority has been collected at this point. Um, with that, uh, looking at the general fund, one of the th things that we look at every year, one of the things that the city pays particular attention to is that unassigned fund balance. Uh, 6.9 million and then there's some e earmarks that uh, leave that around 5.4 million. The city has had a policy to have an unassigned fund balance of around 15 percent of your general fund budget. You guys actually came in at 17 percent, so you're above that. Uh, to give you some perspective from a benchmarking standpoint, the Government Financers, Finance Officers Association recommends just over 16 percent. So again, you're just above that mark. I w certainly, given the hurricane discussion and being a coastal city, we will never recommend going below that, but you're, you're just above that mark. You're above where your policy is, so that's, uh, that's excellent from the city's perspective. Finally, just to hit the, the pension funds. Uh, significant activities there, investment income of uh, nearly $12 million, uh, of return among the three pension funds of around 11 percent on average. Uh, part, that had a big impact on your unfunded liability. As you can see, over the last four years, it's gone from a $35 million unfunded liability to a $25 million unfunded liability, much to do with decisions made uh, by this commission and by uh, market results as you go through. So uh, as you can see, a good good progress there from that standpoint. Uh, again, that hits the highlights of of the audit we've gone through in detail uh, with each of you, and of course, we're always available for more questions uh, should you have any. Thank you, Mike. Any questions? Deputy Mayor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, Mike, happy birthday. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. And uh, you know, we've we've had a, a good relationship with your company and for a long time. And I appreciate the hard work that you all do coming in and making sure that everything is above par. I want to take a moment for uh, just to, to mention our, our city manager who has a finance background. One of the main reasons I decided she was the right person for the job about 10 years ago. And Kelly McGuire in the back of the room who your office, Ms. McGuire, I know has just been extremely busy. So, so thank you for that. Um, Mr. Mayor. I'm always proud that Ormond Beach keeps our financial house in order. And, you know, we mentioned these two hurricanes. Our city has enough money to make sure that we have garbage trucks picking up the debris that's not sitting dangerously on the streets where our residents live. It's picked up and moved in a timely manner, and that's because our financial house is in order, and we have money to pay for that and then wait years for FEMA to reimburse a certain percentage of that. Also, with our 15% threshold that we give ourselves, that, that's, that's the limit we said as a minimum we need to have, and we're at 17.37% for our, our rainy day fund savings account. Just another great review, and I just wanted to take a moment to mention it. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mike, you can grab a seat. Thank you so much for that presentation. Kelly and Chris, I'll ask you guys just to come up for a second. I want to... 
recognize you. You guys do a tremendous, and your staff do a tremendous amount of work. I know with Joyce and Claire's help, supervision, but uh, this year was particularly challenging because we're kind of switching from the past and moving to the present with the, the Tyler Technologies piece. And so to perform all this information and prepare all these reports and really come through the audit in a clean way, once again, is just, it's an amazing accomplishment and you guys deserve to be congratulated by, not only by us, but by your residents. So turn around and we're gonna give you a hand and say thank you. A lot of people don't know, but uh, Kelly will meet with you if you ever have any question about any budget item, uh, just like the city manager would. And also, when it comes to the audit, the folks at James Moore will meet with pretty much any resident to talk about the processes they go through, how detailed they are, and what's required for uh, government accounting. And so it's a transparent process. It's an open process. We're proud of that. And year after year, you guys win the awards for, for upholding those high standards. So thank you, Mike. Thanks again, Kelly and Chris. With that, we move on to audience remarks regarding items not on the agenda. And first up is Ike Leary. Hi, Ike Leary. Hey, Ike. We're not up here, bait and tackle for 20 years now. Awesome. 20 more would be good. That's right. Uh, uh, that Saturday, we had the contest, the fishing contest. We had 40-some kids. They ate 72 hot dogs in an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> they were... That you provided. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, it was a good turnout. Everybody had fun. Uh, our peer over here, it's coming along. They're doing a good job. Uh, uh, I'm looking at, I'm thinking the end of March. I don't know if they're going to make it or not, but they're doing a good job, great job. Uh, one more thing is uh, uh, I would like to get in on the planning of the new bait shop. I think me being there, I got a pretty good idea of what we need. Uh, you can always get a hold of me anytime. And for that, I'll say good night. Great. Thank you, Ike. Thank you. I heard from one of the parents of a child that participated in the fishing tournament. They were so impressed that every single child received a fishing pole, basically. And it's Joyce, I guess, Robert, and his staff that make sure, make sure that that happens. But uh, that's a quality activity for a parent or a grandparent to do with a with a child or grandchild and so anything or any time the city can help with that we do three a year thanks to the deputy mayor and his vision for those tournaments uh, it's a great a great thing for for all the families and children involved uh, next we have Ashley Grunewald Um, forgive me because I have not um, gotten to speak before I have had Bill and some of your members in my classroom um, for teacher of the quarter so I want to thank you for recognizing us teachers because um, we do have a great job but it is always tough um, one thing that I wanted to address is um, well we I have a couple questions and I don't know if this is the right venue, but one I was wondering, is there a duty of the board to discuss our um, stopping of the recycling of glass in Ormond? Is that something that is up for discussion or that we have a future site on how we can alleviate this issue that's obviously a crisis and what are we gonna do about that? Right, it's something I think that's always up for further discussion. We just had two or three big meetings on that and renewed our recycling contract if I'm not mistaken for another five years um, but the glass component is uh, something that 
still bothers me. I don't know how the rest of the commission feels, but uh, probably would be best to talk to Gabe Menendez first, our public works director, and then our city manager, Joyce Shanahan, and they can give you direction. And if you feel like you haven't gotten anywhere, then you can come back and talk to us again. Okay, because it seems like we've got a lot of money in reserves and just, you know, thinking, I know we want to do a sort of education piece on that for the community and what is recyclable and what is not. So um, if we I always have ideas for creative ways to educate. Great. Um, also, something that we brought to the attention of the city um, is Tomoka Elementary and their um, school zone, as well as the um, <coughs> markings or the the um, signage for that area. We have um, we went down to the police department to discuss speeding in that area, people coming right out, and it just doesn't seem like the signs were posted in the right positions as far as where they need to be in location to the school. So we have a few people on that. I just wanted to bring that to the attention because that is a um, obviously a small area. We all know that um, area, but it really needs to have some better signage and maybe more policing in, in order to kind of get it under control because we're bike riders. We live in that area, and it is... Um, it's pretty dangerous in the morning, depending on that. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Great. Thank you. The police chief can give you his card. Uh, uh, somebody from his staff is already well aware of that area, and they can work with you on, on your concerns with that. And I want to thank them as well. We went out there, and maybe a two days later um, or a day later, they had their motorcycle policemen there and pulling people over. So they were really effective in taking that bit of advice and coming out to see. So. Great. Thank you for that, as well as cleaning the signage. Awesome. All right. Thank you. And Sandy Kaufman. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, yes, my name is Sandy Kaufman. I live at 23 Wildwood Trail, Ormond Beach, of course. Now, if my name sounds familiar, it's because I ran for the City Commission Zone 3 seat last year. Uh, Ms. Persis won that seat. And after the election, I reached out to congratulate her. I did. And when we spoke recently, it reminded me of how one of my 2018 goals had been completed. I aimed at having a woman elected to the City Commission. I did. And as you can see, that goal has been completed. So I absolutely have to wish her well, and I mean that sincerely, Susan. I do. Now the reason I'm here today, and I'll be brief. <laughs> I talk all day. So trust me, I'll be brief. I just want to share my opinion on a few issues. I do not support the half cent sales tax. I do not support changing to four-year terms in office. I do not believe in supporting staggered year elections. Hopefully some of the Ormond Beach residents that voted for me are listening. If these issues are put on our ballots, I hope these same individuals that voted for me will now vote with me when the issues come onto the ballot, if that time comes. But in the interim, I just want to say thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Approval of minutes. The minutes from the February 5th, 2019 City Commission meeting uh, have been sent to everyone, uh, posted, I believe, at the back of the room and also in the library and online. Uh, any additions, corrections, or deletions? Hearing none, we will deem those approved and move on to the consent agenda. The action uh, proposed is stated for each item on the consent agenda. Unless a city commissioner removes an item, no discussion on individual items will occur, and a single motion will approve all items. 
Anyone wish to pull anything from the consent agenda? Yes. Deputy Mayor Kent. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull item J. Anyone else? Just need a motion to approve absent item J. Move for approval of the consent agenda absent item J. Second. And Lisa, if you would, please call the vote. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? <clears throat> yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And that brings us to 7J, auto renewal contract for the Orma Beach Historical Trust. Is there anything to read on that, Lisa? No. No. All right. Deputy Mayor Kent? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I just have a question for whoever the representative is, if they're here from the Orma Beach Historical Trust before we approve this contract. Is there anybody here from the Historical Trust? Mr. Massfeller, would you mind coming up? I have a question for you. Thanks, Mr. Massfeller. Uh, before us, we, we have an, an opportunity to continue our our long healthy relationship with the trust appreciate that yeah absolutely and and the budget impact is fifteen thousand eight hundred ten dollars from the city and and you guys you know provide some services to correct to the citizens of Ormond Beach and also visitors alike and things like that my question you know I wanted to bring it up now before I before I was a yes or a no on this because I've been scratching my head and I haven't talked to the historical trust yet and I wanted to find out so maybe you can help me with this I'll do my best thank you so a few months back, Mr. Holub offered to give the trust $10,000, and there was going to be a parking lot near the Three Chimneys site. Correct. And you all declined that amount of money. Correct. Okay. And, and later on, it looks like you all want to accept that amount of money with no strings on it to what it can be used for. Is that correct? And that was his offer. Right. Correct. That was his offer. Yes. My question is, why... Why doesn't the historical trust want to have parking places to access the Three Chimneys historical site of the oldest rum distillery in North America? Actually, we have better parking than he can offer us. To the west side of the uh, Three Chimneys, there's an office complex there. I can't remember the name of it, but they've contracted with us for 10 years to allow us to park there. You do have a contract we with We do them. have a contract. Okay, it's 10 years? Uh, check with Dr. Shapiro, but I'm pretty sure when it was signed a year or two ago, it was for 10 years. I may not be right on that, but I, we can check. Ms. Shanahan, does, does our staff, do we know about that? Do we know about a, a parking agreement? Because I got to tell you, me, me approving, and if that's true, I'm going to vote yes on that because I'm happy about that. But it bothers me that, you know, there's an opportunity to have parking at a, at a one, you know, a very historically rich site and if there's an agreement, great, but if not, then people are parking in someone else's parking lot trying to get to a site that, gosh, why wouldn't we have parking spots available there? Well, that's a private agreement between the Historical Society and that plaza. If they have one, I'm not aware of it. Correct. Is Dr. Shapiro here? He is not. He's out of town. He's out of town. Okay. I, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know his personal, you know, calendar. I don't know where he is. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead, Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to approve this on, on the good word of Mr. Massfeller that they do have a parking agreement. Um, my concern is, of course, is when that 10 years is up. You know, I'd, I'd like for people to be able to go to the site and access sure. it and learn about it. It's a wonderful um, educational piece that we have in Ormond Beach, and I just want to make sure that we're able to access it. Appreciate it. The other thing is that's a lot closer to our entrance. If we were to have accepted him, You'd either have to go through those woods, which is state property, we can't do that, or go up to the sidewalk and walk along the sidewalk for a quarter of a mile almost. So it's, it is our parking arrangements now are much closer to the entrance of the site. Thank you, Mr. Massimo. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions? Lisa, please call the vote on 7J. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Mayor Partington. Yes. And now would be the appropriate time if any member of the commission would like to comment on the consent agenda or any item. All right. In that case, we will move to public hearings. And I will open the public hearings at this time. 
and ask the clerk to read 8A. Resolution 2019-45, a resolution authorizing the execution and issuance of a development order for a special exception to allow outdoor storage at Big Chief Travel Center located at 1560 North US Highway 1, which is within the B7 Highway Tourist Commercial Zoning District, establishing conditions and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution 2019-45, read by title only. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, before we do any cards or motions or seconds, I'll ask Planning Director Stephen Spraker to uh, speak on this item. Good evening, my name is Steve Spraker. I'm the Planning Director with the City. This is a request for a special exception at 1560 North US 1. Uh, the property is shown on the screen above. And as part of continuing code enforcement within a North US 1 corridor, um, this site had some outdoor storage that our code enforcement sought to uh, kind of rein in and bring back to what our code allows. Um, they are seeking to allow four um, outdoor trailers for products related to their principal use. This project, this property was established in unincorporated Volusia County, was annexed into the city. We believe that by allowing the special exception, the outdoor activity, that it would better define what can be stored and basically to allow our code enforcement to ensure that none of the other trailers are on site. So this provides some of the framework and parameters to bring the site into compliance. The uh, planning board did recommend approval of this special exception by a seven to zero vote. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions for Stephen? I have one card and it's from uh, Harley Head, the property owner, I believe. Harley? Understood. Any questions for the property owner? All right, thank you. Uh, in that case, I just need a motion and a second. Move for approval of resolution number 2019-45. I second it. Any discussion? Yes. Deputy Mayor Kent. I hate the way it looks. I'm just going to put it out there. I hate the way that looks. I, 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 my only thing is it was sort of grandfathered in from the county before. That's why it's kind of okay with me. I, I, and Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, and I appreciate that, you know, from, from the commissioner, I, I understand that. It, it was annexed in, into the city, and it just, uh, I, I'm, listen, I'm pleased that if this gets approved, you know, the trailers are going to be behind a building, and it's not going to be as in your face as it, as it was. Um, certainly no offense to the, the owner. Thank you for being here tonight, but you just, I want, I'm glad you're here. I want you to hear it from me. I hate the way it looks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I, you know, to some extent I agree. It, it's not the greatest looking. Um, it was grandfathered in from the county. So uh, what I really appreciate is Mr. Head working with our staff and our staff working with him to try to make it work. These roadside fruit stands are part of old Florida. And uh, so that tugs a little bit at, at my heartstrings when I pass these places that are uh, really kind of a relic from the uh, creation of the interstate transportation system in the 50s and uh, but the look of it I think what bothers me the most we're taking care of the trailers by getting them behind the business but some kind of storage crate that's just lined up all along the side of the property when I drove by today just to take another look at it uh, it looks better now than these pictures have it looking um, if there was a way to get those storage containers behind the property somehow where you don't see it from US-1, I think that would be an improvement. But uh, because you're working with us, and I, I really appreciate that, and uh, it's, it's improving, the situation seems to be improving, I'm gonna support it tonight as well. So unless anybody has anything else, I'll ask Lisa to call the vote. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Kent? No. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And we move to 8B. Ordinance number 2019-2, an ordinance adopting certain updated schedules to the capital improvements element of the City of Ormond Beach Comprehensive Plan, 
providing when such update shall take effect, repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof, and setting forth an effective date. This is ordinance number 2019-2, read by title only. Thank you, Lisa. And again, I'll ask planning director to address this item. These are amendments to the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, they're designed to incorporate the changes from the capital in improvements element related to our capital improvement. So our budget is coordinated with our comprehensive plan. Um, these are administrative amendments. They don't actually change the text of the goals, policies, and objectives of the comprehensive plan. Um, the planning board recommended approval. They show that the city is meeting level of service standards for water, sewer, stormwater, solid waste, roads, and park recreation, and schools. Staff is recommending approval of the amendment. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions for Stephen? All right. I don't have any cards on 8B, and I just need a motion in a second. Mr. Mayor, move, move approval. I second the motion. Any discussion? Lisa, please call the vote. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 8C. Ordinance number 2019-3, an ordinance amending paragraph C, official zoning map of section 2-01, establishment of zoning districts and official zoning map of article 1, establishment of zoning districts and official zoning map of chapter 2, district and general regulations of the city of Ormond Beach land development code by amending the official zoning map to rezone a certain parcel of real property totaling approximately 3.56 acres located at 275 Interchange Boulevard, Volusia County parcel number 41251000006B from B7 Highway Tourist Commercial with a planned business development overlay, Southwest I-95 complex to plan business development, authorizing revision of official zoning map, repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof, and setting forth an effective date. This is ordinance number 2019-3, read by title only. Thank you, Lisa. And Stephen, we're keeping you busy tonight. Yes. Not over. This is a request for uh, rezoning, and it's related to both items C and D, so I'll do the presentation on both. Um, this request seeks a planned business development rezoning from the B7 zoning district and also seeks the next item would be the issuance of the development order. The property is located along Interchange Boulevard. This is the Baymont uh, located next door. This would be Interchange Boulevard and then I-95. Um, the property was previously approved for the Tomoka Estates Apartments, which um, are no longer pursuing the property. The site plan for the project complies with our land development code. The reason that they are going through this plan development is to defer 39 parking spaces. Um, they are not waiving the parking spaces. They're simply uh, reserving an area shown here in yellow that if they do need future parking in, in the future, they can come back and they can construct the parking. Um, in the interim, that area would be left as uh, trees. So you'll have the 15% preservation from the site plus that additional area. The site is a four-story hotel. There is 124 rooms. Um, it is consistent with our land development code. It's consistent with our comprehensive plan. Again, if they weren't seeking the parking deferral, this would be a staff approval. There was a neighborhood meeting uh, that was held in December. Um, it was attended by a couple of the surrounding business owners who were supportive of it. The planning board recommended approval of the appli application. The staff is also recommending approval. Thank you. Any questions for Stephen? Yes, Deputy Mayor Ken. Um, Stephen, Planning Director, what, what's going to trigger to for the company to have to, you know, build more parking? What what becomes the trigger? When does the city say, "Hey, time for you to put that parking in"? If, if there's a consistent um, observance that basically their parking demand is greater than what they have there, um, their business model and what they've shown us, um, this is a different style of hotel, and I'll, I'll let the applicant address that a little bit. For example, they don't have a restaurant. They don't have a pool. Right. So, so they have a different model than our code um, envisions for, for a hotel. And, so if you, and, if, and if you don't mind, I, I get that, and I understand why we're doing it, and I'm ready to approve it personally. I don't even need to hear from the applicant on it because it makes sense. It's a different model. It's a different type. I just wanted to hear, and I wanted the audience to hear, what is the trigger where we're going to say you have to you have to do more and hopefully it's more than just an observance well it would be a code enforcement action if, if there is observed for example if they're parking along interchange boulevard 
and we observe that and it's a prolonged period of time not just a one-day occurrence we will then contact the property owner tell them that it's time to do the parking if they don't agree then they can appeal it to the city commission mr hayes what kind of teeth do we have in that to make sure that happens well i'm trying to <clears throat> pull up the development order um, i seem to recall putting some language in the development order that it would be based on the determination by the uh, city staff okay for that to occur okay um as long as it's there mr hayes i'm, I'm fine with it yep i believe it is uh, we'll confirm it before second reading uh, for, for certain perfect it's actually in the next slide Zoning, so it's on the next side. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Stephen. Only card I have is uh, from Peter Pinsa representing the applicant. Any questions for the applicant at this point? All right. I just need a motion and a second. I move for approval ordinance number 2019-3. I second. All right. Any other discussion? Lisa, please call the vote. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. That brings us to 8D. Ordinance number 2019-4, an ordinance authorizing the execution and issuance of a development order for a planned business development to be known as Extended Stay America, authorizing the construction of a four-story all suites hotel with 124 rooms along with associated site improvements to be located at 275 interchange boulevard volusia county parcel number 41251000006b authorizing a parking deferral of 39 parking spaces establishing conditions and expirations of approval and setting forth an effective date this is ordinance number 2019-4 read by title only thank you lisa any other questions for Stephen, planning director? Did you have anything else, Stephen? Mr. Mayor, I would move approval. Second. Any other discussion? Just quickly, if I could have Mr. Hayes yes, share what he found. Paragraph three, just to address your earlier question, and I'll, I'll read it for you. Uh, it says that the, um, let's see here. In the event the city determines that additional parking is required, the applicant shall, without delay, construct the additional parking spaces in accordance with the city's requirements. The deferred uh, spaces shall be constructed when it's necessary to, uh, in accordance with established uh, construction standards. If the city or the applicant determines that a need for such spaces, spaces exist. Um, so we, we have enough um, teeth in there to make sure that it occurs. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. ordinance number 2019-4 we've had a motion and a second any other questions discussion Lisa please call the vote Commissioner Littleton yes Commissioner Kent yes Commissioner Persis yes Mayor Partington yes that brings us to 8e ordinance number 2019-5 an ordinance authorizing the execution and issuance of a first amended plan business development order for the Granada Point plan business development located at 520 West Granada Boulevard, Volusia County parcel number 42414800010, 550 West Granada Boulevard, Volusia County parcel number 42414800020. 600 West Granada Boulevard, Volusia County Parcel Number 42414800030, 650 West Granada Boulevard, Volusia County Parcel Number 42414800040, 535 Tomoka Avenue, Volusia County Parcel Number 42414800000A, 101 Bennett Lane, Volusia County Parcel Number 4241. 4800000B, 655 West Granada Boulevard, Volusia County Parcel Number 42410112010100, No Address North Side of Granada Boulevard, Volusia County Parcel Number 42410112010100, No Address North Side of Granada Boulevard, Volusia County Parcel Number 42410110070. No address north side of Granada Boulevard, Volusia County Parcel Number 4241 0109 
No address north side of Granada Boulevard, Volusia County, parcel number 42410109010 to allow privacy walls to range from a minimum of six feet in height to a maximum of eight feet in height to remove the condition for an easement for eight parking spaces on the north parcel, providing for the $10,000 contribution to be made to the Ormond Beach Historical Society and clarifying that two out parcels are permitted on unit four. Establishing conditions and expirations of approval, ratifying and confirming all prior approvals, and setting forth an effective date. This is ordinance number 2019 5, read by title only. Thank you, Lisa. And I will ask uh, Planning Director Stephen Spraker to speak on this item. This is a planned business development amendment. In 2017, there was a planned business development rezoning and the issuance of a development order that established specific standards for this property. Um, it has been under construction uh, primarily for infrastructure improvements, almost like a subdivision where you're doing the roads, the water, the sewer. Um, quickly going through what was approved in 2017, unit one was shown with a drive through restaurant, shown in pink. Unit two was a retail uh, unit with approximately 26,000 square feet of retail. Unit three was the, is the Wawa gas station of approximately 6,100 square feet. Unit four is a grocery site with approximately 42,000 square feet shown. There is a 6.71 acre stormwater compensating storage uh, retention pond which is constructed. The north side has a retail area of approximately 15,000 square feet. And then there is a 10 acre preservation parcel. The application the amendment goes through a series of processes the first it starts with our site plan review committee which is our administrative committee reviews the application a neighborhood meeting was held on December the 18th the planning board uh, took into account what the SPRC had to say the neighborhood meeting and the comments at the planning board and they made recommendations which we'll go over and then the City Commission is required to hold two readings and then whatever is approved would go back to the site plan review committee who would issue site and building permits, and then ultimately uh, a certificate of occupancy. Running through the amendments, uh, the first amendment is to allow a car wash as a permitted use within the development. The area is shown as unit one. The site plan shows a loading area of two, two, bay, two bays that lead into the building, which is approximately 4,700 square feet. Um, as part of the application, there were conditions um, such as hours of operation, the fact there would be no detailing on site, and the vacuum system would only operate when the car wash is operational. At the planning board meeting, there were additional conditions that were offered, uh, reducing the hours of operation to 8 o'clock, and then amending the architectural elevations. This is the architectural elevation that was provided and is also in your packet. The screen up, up top was the previous uh, architectural elevation of the building, and this is the architectural elevation of the proposed car wash after the planning board meeting. The applicant has provided in your packet the stated benefits, and I'll let them run through what they are uh, stating the benefits are, which include uh, limiting the trip generation and reducing the operating hours. In staff's review, uh, one of the things we looked at was uh, the definitions which were uh, talked about there in the planning board. Um, three key definitions on what a personal service is. Personal service in, under our land development code, it means a beauty parlor, shop, salon, barbershop, or tanning salon, and similar uses. Retail sales and services are those business activities customarily providing retail goods and household services, and then it goes to give on a laundry list of, of examples. And then vehicle wash and detailing means an establishment engaged in the business of washing and or detailing vehicles with self-service, automated, or staff facilities. So those are three definitions that we kept in mind during our review. Under our review, um, we looked at both our comprehensive plan, which includes a future land use map, and we looked at the land development code. The concern that staff um, has is that the land use, which this use is under, the residential office retail, doesn't allow automobile related use. Those uses have been directed to the heavy commercial land use in the corresponding B5 zoning district. So if you're going to look under our land development code, that vehicle wash use is allowed under the B5 zoning district, which has been typically along um, US1 and a little bit along uh, the Granada Boulevard corridor, but not where this application is going. 
So staff's uh, concern and review is basically this use is not consistent with the comprehensive plan, not consistent with that land use category. Um, the recommendation from staff was denial, and then a planning board recommendation was also denial by a four to three vote, and the minutes are included in your packet. The second amendment was to allow a range of wall height. Um, the development order um, allowed a portion of the wall to be eight feet in height uh, based on comments received at the planning board meeting, and this is the example of the eight foot wall versus the six foot wall. There's another area of wall with unit four that potentially could be used for an eight foot wall. Uh, the applicant does not intend to go back and replace the six-foot wall, but it provides the opportunity to go to an eight-foot height if the city commission uh, approves it. Both the staff and the planning board recommend approval of this amendment. The third amendment was based on a provision within a development order that required eight non-exclusive parking spaces. Um, the applicant and the historical society um, have communicated there's a desire not to have those spaces, so the applicant is, is requesting that that provision of the development order be deleted. These were where the eight spaces were shown on the original site plan in 2017. Both staff and the planning board both uh, recommended it, approval of this amendment. Amendment four deals with the $10,000 in contribution. The original application um, had, had a direction to use it as part of the three chimney site. There was a, a letter amending that, so basically the applicant is uh, recommending to give it to the Historical Society to use as they uh, see as appropriate. Both staff and the Planning Board recommend approval of this amendment. Amendment five is a clarification within the text of the development order. It allows uh, the development to have eight to five commercial parcels. This is a condominium form of ownership, so each unit can have its own condominium. Um, but the accompanying site plan didn't show eight commercial parcels. So this is how the applicant would propose to lay it out. Um, some of that could change depending on the size of the grocery store. Um, staff did the analysis and had no objection. They are not increasing the number of trips and they are not increasing the access to the site. Again, both staff and the planning board recommended approval of this. The final amendment was for historic tree number 19 on a north parcel. Um, the tree is located at the um, just west of where the entrance would be. This is a picture of the tree. Uh, we had an arborist go out and take a look at this tree. Um, it was not uh, defined in a declining state. It was defined as a healthy tree. We had the three arborists on city staff go out and take a look at this tree. Um, their conclusions were the same as the independent arborist. Uh, staff is not recommending removal of that tree. Um, and this is kind of a summary of the six amendments, how staff uh, recommended and then how the planning board recommended. Uh, if there are any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. Any questions at this time for Stephen? All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. We'll start with Mark Watts, who is the uh, representative for the applicant. All right. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, I'm Mark Watts uh, with the law firm of Cobb Cole. And my address is 231 North Woodland Boulevard in Deland. I'm on the other side of the county with our office over there. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you this evening. And, and let me start out by thanking Steve and, and uh, the rest of your staff for doing a good job, uh, even though we you know, agreed to disagree on, on certain elements of the application. Um, uh, they've done a professional job as always. So we thank them for that. Um, I, I, you know, as you can see, there are, there are six total items in the, in the application before you this evening. Um, with respect to items two through five, as, as Steve just uh, gone through them, I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about those unless you have a particular question you'd like for us to <clears throat> respond to. Item number six, with regard to the tree, um, we you know we, we are fine with with whatever the planning commission and, and the and the city commission you know want to to do with that. I think the the primary goal with putting that request in this application moving forward was to put everybody on notice that there is an issue there that the tree could ultimately come down on the, the mast arm signals that the city will be taking over from a maintenance standpoint. So we wanted that to, to be of record. And the last item, you know, really relates, well, the first item in, in your list, uh, really relates to, to the character of the use on, on a portion of the property. Um, Steve, in his analysis and, and, and his presentation just a minute ago, has, has reached the conclusion that, that that's not consistent with the, the current ROR land use classification. Um, we think that you have the latitude to, 
to determine that it is. Um, I'm going to ask Paul to come up real quick because Paul is, is, has prepared a, a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to walk you through some of the elements of the, the overall um, request, and then we'll get back up and talk about the actual uh, land use analysis. So, Paul. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the Commission. For your record, my name is Paul Holub. I am the managing member of Granada Investors uh, LLC. And uh, before I flip through the uh, PowerPoint, I just want to say, uh, clarify a couple things, because some people in the audience may want to speak on this item. Um, we are not requesting approval of additional fast food restaurants under this application. Matter of fact, we're eliminating one if the uh, amendment is approved. We are no longer requesting the removal of the tree, as, as Mark has said. Uh, there's no discharge of water from the car wash into the stormwater system whatsoever. Everything is collected in the tunnel. All of the pollutants are collected in the tunnel into basically what is a grease trap similar to a restaurant. And um, we are not withdrawing our donation to the historical society. We are still going to make the donation to them with no strings attached. And as you heard earlier, um, they have reasons for not uh, accepting the, the parking spaces and building a, a walkway over to the facility. I didn't realize that the distance was as much as it was. So they have parking facility. We're still making the donation. Uh, we just need to take it through this PBD amendment in order to move forward with that. The uh, site plan you see here uh, basically depicts, as Stephen said, the The, sorry. the car wash on lot one, um, right now we're in the process of uh, designing the shops at Granada Point on lot two, which will be a mixed use retail center, uh, somewhat similar in des design as Tuscany shops, uh, Wawa's on lot three, and on lot four, uh, that was the original grocery size store, although the current chain that we're negotiating with is in the 25, 26,000 square foot range, so it's going to be a smaller footprint. And uh, there was anticipation to have multiple out parcels, although it's very likely that the out parcel on the corner will not occur if the, if the grocery store uh, comes in because they've demanded more visibility to Granada. I'm going to skip over the historical because I think we've already covered that as we've covered the tree. Um, the history on the wall was when we were installing the wall or actually at the PBD meeting when this original project was approved, somebody from the neighborhood said, could you put an eight-foot wall in this particular area? We got up and said yes. We started to build it and a couple of the other homeowners along Tomoka Avenue said, well, can you do eight foot all the way? Unfortunately, we couldn't because it was locked into a development order in a PBD and we didn't have the four or five month time frame it took to go through the process to increase the wall to eight feet. With that said, we wanted to make sure we had that flexibility when the grocery store develops because the difference in cost between an eight foot wall and a six foot wall is, is very nominal. Um, the original car wash uh, architecture as Stephen showed you before, was uh, designed several months ago as they came in and, and looked at this project. And it was more of a modern look. And during the planning board meeting, we got to the presentation and they opened up on their iPad and I noticed this. And I asked the developers, well, how come we've never seen that architecture? And he said, well, they just, uh, just evolved in a project to two locations in Naples, Florida, and this is what Naples, Florida required. And quite honestly, this is more in tune with what has developed in our community. Uh, so uh, during the, the planning board meeting, I spoke to the buyers, the developers, and they said yes, that if they came to Ormond Beach, if this project was approved, that they would pursue this type of architecture and use what's called the Naples, Florida plan uh, for, for the development. That's the interior of the facility. It's a very high-tech uh, operation. They do not 
touch your car. Matter of fact, their insurance policy prohibits them from touching your car. Unlike Sparkle and Shine that might have 20 or 25 employees at any given time, they have uh, three to four employees and on their peak weekends they might have five or six. And it's really just to get you through the tunnel, make sure you pay at the, uh, the automated uh, machines as you come in. And uh, they do not detail your car, they do not vacuum your car. You can vacuum the car on your own if you would like. This is from their Naples, Florida uh, plan. And what was interesting about this was the location of it, which was in somewhat of more of a residential area. You see all the residential communities that surround it. And this is the area where it is being built. Um, and it's typical in a lot of other communities too. And I'll talk about the, the definition of the use um, in a moment. This was a study done for a community of our size, 62,000 passenger cars. And this is just what gets released into the storm sewer system when you wash your cars at home. Uh, the contaminants, the pollutants is significant. The traffic, uh, the, the, the traffic generation for car wash is probably one of the lowest generators. Uh, it's about 20% of what a fast food uh, facility would generate on that site. Uh, they have about three to 400 cars uh, daily on an average. And a fast food site, I believe, hits a trip generation of about 2,000 daily trips. So the traffic is significantly less. And this is just from the developer uh, based on their other locations and their the number of trips and the number of, I'm sorry, the number of cars that they have in the facility. Uh, there's always concern with noise, so we did provide a study for the blower, no, uh, the dryer, and also for the vac system. And what we found was that all of these, you have to be within 20 to 30 feet of the actual blower motor, which is up in this area, or the vacuum system, which is inside the building in this area. Uh, you can see where from the back of the building, we're 180 feet to the nursing home and to these two residential homes here, we're 348 feet on this home and 417 feet on this home. Those studies don't take into account the fact that we have an eight foot wall that also screens the building. We have a 1.4 acre retention pond with a fountain that will be running most of the day that also adds additional buffer. So. There's absolutely no impact with regard to noise to any of the residential community. Um, I believe, at least I had believed, this was your definition of, of a car wash in Ormond Beach, and maybe that's changed, but this was what I found in the code. It's very outdated. Uh, this definition is probably 35 plus years old. It, it certainly refers to the open bay, five, six uh, stall open bay like you have at US-1 and the sparkle and shine. But it does not incorporate the type of facility that we're presenting to you tonight. Um, and with that said, you know, other communities that we have talked to um, consider the car wash to be a service related item, St. Augustine, um, St. Augustine considers it a service-related item allowed in most of their uh, commercial and retail. Daytona Beach allows it in their business retail. Port Orange allows it along Dunlawton in their commercial retail areas. Um, there's Winter Park allows it as a conditional use in their commercial C3. Uh, Naples permits it as a non-auto use. It is not considered a automotive use in most communities. And some communities actually call it a auto care others service, others retail. Uh, but this type of facility is, is leaps and bounds from an automotive use such as a tire store or a muffler shop. Right now, a car wash is permitted on the Granada Point project without any public hearing, without any public approval. 
It's under the Type C convenience gas use. Staff will tell you that, well, Type C, you can have convenience gas, you can have fast food with a drive through and you can have a car wash. So you could have a convenience gas store, 6,500 square feet. You can have a component of a fast food interior with a drive through and you can have a car wash. Well, actually, there are, car, there are uh, gas operators, national companies, that are building these with the type of tunnel system we're talking about. And this is, I believe, Pace in Jacksonville, where this is the convenience gas with the canopy, and this is their full tunnel car wash. And there's several, I'm sorry, there's, there's several of these being built across the country. So if Wawa wanted to put in a full tunnel car wash, they could do it. It's permitted today. Now, they might tell you that, well, that's an accessory use, and it can only be a certain size based on the size of car wash. I don't read the code that way. It doesn't say that there's a limitation on square footage, but let's take a moment and say it is. Wawa builds a 6,500 square foot convenience gas building. They would be limited to a 3,250 square foot tunnel car wash. You still can do a full service car wash. Um, that's permitted today without any other approval from the city commission. Staff takes the position that it can only be 50% of the floor area and they gave a, before they gave a, an example of the shell at Granada. Well, honestly, I went by there and I measured. The car wash, even though it's closed, is not 50% of, of the convenience gas. It's actually bigger than the convenience gas building. Uh, and that might be an outdated uh, uh, use. It might have happened long before our current codes. But times do change. We never had convenience gas ABC. They evolved for a reason, and they evolved because of the racetracks and the Wawa's in our community. And the same thing is going on now with these car washes. These car washes are being built all over the country, and a lot of them are going into the upper scale communities, um, and they're multi-million dollar investments, and times have changed. And you probably will never ever see another open bay car wash built in our community. And you may not ever see another sparkle and shine in our community. That particular facility is busting, at the, is busting at the seams. There's no question about it. It has now stacking for full service is on US-1. So when you enter the car wash, your stacking is only in this area here. Your exterior car wash only comes out through the back as it does. It has two lanes. But the full service, you basically have three cars, two lanes, three cars each, and then you're in US-1. Our facility has stacking for 35 cars. We're never going to have a stacking issue there. We're on an acre and a half plus storm water. And there's nothing bad about sparkle and shine. We use it, we use it every, every week. I mean, it's great, but it's morphed into, since 2004, it's continued to grow. Additional services have expanded. And it really could be um, a problem one day with, with stacking uh, up, up on US-1. People have questioned, well, what's going to happen on Granada? And it's just not a concern with, with the amount of stacking that we have. We have the ability to have two lanes of stacking that comes all the way around up to here. Plus, there's five cars that can fit, depending on the size of the cars. But typically, you can have five cars come through this tunnel. In addition, we increased the buffer to 55 foot in this area. We also screened all of this area heavily and increased these buffers so that you cannot see any of the vacuum area. We also have on-site parking. I mean, Sparkle and Shine doesn't have one employee parking space, yet they have 20, 25 employees at one, one time. We have plenty of parking on-site for employees. We have plenty of parking uh, for the vacuum facility. And as you can see, there's a good deal of the space is green. We have the eight foot wall that's in this area and the large fountain. So all of this area from here back buffers us to the neighborhood, well, plus Tomoka Avenue and then the residential neighborhood. Uh, and we're not changing any of the ingress, egress patterns for the site. Everything is remaining the same as originally planned.
The, the last thing I'd like to bring to your attention is the issue on the comp plan. When we brought Granada Point through and got it approved, the planning board, the city commission, the staff, the planning director supported the project. And they supported convenience gas type C. This use is allowed in the commercial zoning districts of B4, B7, B8, which is none of the zoning districts that this land is in. But they allowed it in this. So they made a policy decision to also take a use that was not allowed in the B10 district, and they permitted it. And when they permitted it, they specifically said that these convenience stores type C and the uses associated with them are retail uses. There's no question that the convenience store is a retail use. The, the sale of gasoline is the retail use. You can have a fast food or a subway shop or whatever inside as an additional type C use. And the car wash was part of that, which by definition was a retail use. They allowed that use into this development order, into this planned business development. They also did it with the bowling alley. The bowling alley was only allowed in a B8 commercial zoning district, and they allowed the bowling alley to be part of a permitted use in the Granada Point. So it truly is, as Mark will expand on further, a policy decision for you to determine if this type of use is considered a service use, or a retail use, or is it truly an automotive use, such as a tire store or muffler shop? I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Paul. Paul. Commissioner Persis had a yeah. question. No, I, I'm just wondering you know, what the difference is. You say it's, it's in part of the code, but the city is saying it's not part of the code. That's what I'm not sure about. It might be a question for you or for Randy. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's a good point. I think I think Paul gives you a, a good you know kind of snapshot of the things that have evolved on on this particular um, you know development agreement uh, since the since it was originally approved. Um, you know, I, I think that that one of the things that said that your staff report indicates, and, and I think Steve said in his presentation, is there hasn't been a policy direction to allow this character of use to be considered retail within Ormond. Uh, it hasn't been something that you've considered at retail because you have a separate classification. You have an automotive service use that, that historically, when you're talking about things that have open bays and, and you know, kind of are much more intense type uses from a, from a, you know, kind of a repair standpoint and things of that nature, uh, you have a separate classification. I think what you have here is you have a use that has changed. You have the, the, uh, the type of use that has evolved, and the nature of it now, I think, is much more akin to a personal service or a... A, a, um, a retail use. Um, you know, Paul gave you the list of the other communities and how they look at that. You know, look at it. We have a lot of experience in the land as well, and I talked about this at the planning board. We've, we've got a couple of these that have been installed in the past two years in the land. Both of them have come in as retail uses under the, the commercial classification in the city of the land. Um, they're in areas that are adjacent to residential. They're in areas that are adjacent to other office and things of that nature. Um, you know, I think that if you were looking at this from the standpoint of is this a heavier type commercial or heavier type, right now B5, your, your heavy, you know, uh, commercial service, you know, classification or, you know, the, the I1 in light industrial classification is where, you know, if your staff uh, points out, those are the places where we previously have, have, you know, allocated this use and put this use. Um, but again, I think that as the, as the sitting as the city commission, looking at this in, in, in this set of, con, you know, circumstances with this set of conditions, I think you can look at it and say this this is different, uh, and we can look at this and characterize it as a retail use, and that is something that's consistent with the comprehensive plan and consistent with the overall PBD that's been or the plan development that's been approved here. Um, as Paul indicated, you really have this use already. Um, the nature of the use is permitted with the with the um, the convenience store type C use that's included and already been deemed to be consistent with your comprehensive plan here. Um, that happened when the original approval was in, in place. Um, you know, the, the, really the, the issue is, um, you know, who controls it? So if this, was, if this was adjacent to Wawa and it was part of the Wawa development coming in, um, then you could do this and, and, and move it forward without, without any questions. Um, it would be as long as it was an access, you know, considered accessory to, to that use. Um, the question, you know, what is accessory? Is it square footage or is it revenue driven? Um, you know, I think that's one of those things you get into a discussion, but the character of the use is there. 
Now, in the context of the overall, you know, how, what, what does this do from the standpoint of development in the area? You know, I think Paul has highlighted a lot of the, the, the benefits here. You know, you're really looking at, you know, that lot originally was planned for fast food commercial to come in. Um, you're looking at a use that is 20 to 25 percent of that traffic from a trip generation standpoint. So, you know, we know that the, the constraints that, that have been in place on Granada and the, and the traffic issues that have been there historically, this is an opportunity by approving this and allowing the development to move forward with that particular lot, you have the ability to reduce that overall traffic, um, you know, on Granada um, without changing the, the connection points and everything else, as Paul, as Paul had indicated. So I think in this context, you have that latitude. Um, you know, you sit as the ultimate, you know, judge of is the zoning consistent with, with the comprehensive plan. That's your charge as the, you know, in a quasi-judicial hearing of this nature. You have to look at the context and you have to determine whether or not what's being proposed is consistent with um, the comprehensive plan. And I submit that, that based on the character of the use here and the conditions we're proposing, it is consistent with a retail type use or personal service type use. Thank you, Mark. With that, um, here to answer, I, I, I neglected to, to introduce, we've got Harry Newkirk, who's our project engineer here to answer any questions you might have. Um, and, and Jeff Geisens with the, the, the applicant that's actually the company that would, that would own and construct the, the um, uh, car wash here is, is also here. So Great. We've got a number of cards to get through. We'll come back to you for all that if there's any questions after. That sounds good. If I can just reserve a couple minutes for rebuttal. Absolutely. Yep. Connie Colby. My name, uh, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Connie Colby. I live at 108 Robo Lane. Um, I just feel like I'm coming to this meeting again for about the fourth time. <clears throat> um, I, I'm concerned because we have started out with um, an approval of a place where we had a grocery store, um, uh, maybe a Starbucks, a retail establishment, the grocery store seems to have moved west, the Starbucks moved east, and we're left with a gas station and <clears throat> maybe a car wash. That was not what we were promised at the time. <clears throat> um, I have a lot of things here. <laughs> Look here. Um, on the construction notes, um, sites on each of the plans for these one of the things that they have in there on each one of those construction site plans <clears throat> the governing governing specifications say that the city of ormond beach land development code beach standards construction specifications will be adhered to and i'm not hearing that um, we've had the planning board say no we've heard mr Spre spraker say it didn't meet the land development code, and they still are persisting with this. Um, <clears throat> in that area, that, that's labeled a B9, and I know they have their PBD going on, but there's no mention of the permission to have a car wash in that area. The only car wash that I see any place on these planning sites is light industrial, and I know we have other ones around. Um, so it, it's not really a permitted use for, for anything that I'm able to find anywhere. And it's not called a retail district from what I'm seeing. It's called a boulevard district, boulevard zoning district, which is totally different from a retail district <clears throat> um, the, the architectural style no matter what they want to call it doesn't is not consistent with anything along the boulevard we have things like Lomans we have uh, the doctor's offices along there which are sitting in the office depot they're all sitting back from the road they have nice trees along the way and Putting a car wash at that location is just inconsistent with what it should, what that property should have. Thank you. Oh, me. Eric Breitenbach. Hi, good evening. Uh, 
I'm Eric Breitenbach. I'm a professor at the College of Arts and Sciences at Daytona State since 1981 and a resident of Ormond Beach at 184 Royal Boons Boulevard since 2013. I have some prepared remarks tonight on Granada Point. For decades, Ormond Beach has, been a, has had a reputation as the cultural, historic, environmental, and aesthetic jewel in the crown of East Volusia County, and the city has maintained this reputation consistently and impressively. For decades, the city's leadership and residents saw the wisdom of maintaining a heightened approach to aesthetics and city planning. This was evident in residential developments such as the trails, Tomoka Oaks, and Timber Creek. Houses were designed to blend into, not obstruct, or replace the landscape. Strong land development codes were at that time enacted to protect both trees and their symbiotic wetlands. In the 1990s, residents voted to tax themselves $1.5 million bond to preserve the river's property, 80 acres on the Tomoka. In 2003, Ormond citizens rallied to save the loop and its trees from overdevelopment by the county. In 2006, voters approved a referendum to build, put building height limits in a city to protect our beachfront. Outside entities have also respected our traditions. The National Chain Office Depot acknowledged Ormond's character by preserving a magnificent set of trees. The location of Sahai Pediatrics is even more impressive. The first time I saw the site, I literally did a double take. I had never before seen a more beautiful commercial development. This is the kind of development that Ormond Beach should strive for and reward. The irony is that both are within a stone's throw of the clear-cut Granada Point. If I had more than three minutes, I could further discuss the advantages in the realm of environmental science of such planning strategies, but it may be enough to say that trees clean the air, wetlands prevent flooding, and both are aesthetically splendid and necessary. In 1980, Ormond historian Alice Strickland said the following in her book, Ormond on the Halifax, A Centennial History. Ormond Beach is essentially a town of very attractive residential districts. It has survived storms, economic troubles, wars, and the ever-present threat of overdevelopment. The city government, however, and the people of Ormond Beach have managed so far to value the natural beauty of the town and its surroundings above the material value of indiscriminate development and the destruction of ecological and historically important areas. The early pioneers of Ormond would appreciate and approve of the concern and efforts of its present citizen to preserve these valuable assets so that in another hundred years, Ormond will survive as a town that is noted for its conservative approach to development, one which has retained its God-given beauty and attractions. Thank you. Greg Wiersig. Didn't bring Katie with you? you do, eh? Hi, Greg Wiersig, 562 Woodgrove Street. I live right behind where this Granada Point is going, and I guess I'm going to be in the minority of this group because I support the car wash. Um, it, if I have a choice, it's what he said. I should have been at the planning board meeting. I apologize. There, I, I don't want fast food restaurants. You know, I live right behind it. The hours are longer. The traffic is more. I've been and checked it out. The car wash, where they're sitting there saying, you know, that the landscaping is terrible. I think right now what Mr. Holub has done is beautiful with the fence, the planting of the trees, and he's got more trees coming. If you look at the roadway coming in where he put the palm trees with the lights, all of that is quite beautiful, and I think he went over and above. He dug a bigger pond than was necessary, where people said the clear cutting, you know, took care of it. The ponds will hold a heck of a lot more rain, you know, than what it could have done before with those old trees. So again, with, with the car wash, they've modified the plans. They've changed the car wash. It is quiet, you know, by and self-contained. And I, I, I don't understand why you would want to put a, a uh, fast food restaurants, three or four. Not a few hundred yards down the road, and I know it's just barely out that little zone you're talking about, is, is uh, how many automotive places? There's, you know, the Take Five, there's the Boulevard Tire, there's the Pep Boys. That is not that far out. Now, granted, it's, it is out, so you do have your rules to follow, and I don't know exactly where the zoning stops. 
So if this is becoming an emotional issue because of the trees being down, it shouldn't be looked at that. If it's becoming an issue that's not good for Ormond Beach and we can't make any money out of it and it's not going to be pretty and I think it will be when he gets done, I can understand that. But to, to, we, we really need to think about what's going to go in there and how it affects the residents and we are directly behind it, how it's going to affect us. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Suzanne Scheiber. Good evening. There's a deeply concerning disconnect with what the citizens of Ormond Beach view as a higher quality of life and the devel developments approved by this commission. To cast a vote for a car wash is going against the will of the citizens, the city planning director and planning board. This would be to go against all of those who advise you. I recently conducted a survey using SurveyMonkey asking only one question. What type of small businesses would you like to see at Granada Point? I received 200, 201 responses over a period of nine days. It was posted on Facebook, Nextdoor, and via email. I chose to close the survey, but could have obtained more responses had I left it open longer. It was multiple choice with an added field for comments. Here are the answers to the question. Sit-down restaurants slash non-drive through received 30 votes. Youth-related, such as small hobby, fair trade stores, etc., received 13 votes. Small boutique, clothing, jewelry, accessories, etc., received 5 votes. Wine, cheese, kitchen shops, specialty food shops, etc., received 25 votes. Ice cream, diner, coffee shop, bake shop, etc., received 20 votes. All of the above received 90 votes. This totaled 183 responses for small businesses. The other field received 18 votes with write-ins of various ideas, with most suggested being to put the trees back. A total of 46 people felt compelled to leave comments in the comment field. One comment I'm mentioning voted for all of the above small businesses, but left this reply, which I'm quoting. I would support any small family-owned shops to take the curse off the commercial aspects that are so garish. Since they've already done the great damage to our little town, let's encourage the small business owners who will help to soften the insult. The city of Ormond hosted the series OB Life, which recently wrapped up referring to citizen input. Many survey questions at OB Life received less than 100 respondents, yet it has been said they are being reviewed for the strategic plan of the city. The city of Ormond has far more resources than I do, but I still obtain 201 responses, which I'm providing to you in report by print copy and via email. I hope you put the effort forth in reviewing them since I've obviously received more input from the citizens. In addition, since the developer asked to amend his plans for Granada Point, I, as a citizen of Ormond, affected by the Granada Point development, asked for my own amendments during the planning board meeting on January 10th. I'm resubmitting a revised copy of those amendments this evening. The planning board and planning director have spoken. The citizens challenge you to come up with a better vision for Granada Point with the type of businesses they would prefer. Thank you. Thank you. And give it to Lisa. Lisa's very good about making sure we all get copies. And next will be Rita Press. Good evening, Mayor and City Commissioners. My name is Rita Press, 875 Wilmot Avenue. The issue tonight is not about the design of the car wash. It's not about sparkle and shine. It's not about how technically great this car wash is. The issue is, should a usage, a car wash, that we now allow only in our B5 and industrial areas be allowed on Granada? Granada that is zoned ROR, residential office retail, and is on the gateway to our city. Car washes, 
vehicle rentals, vehicle repairs are all conditional uses allowed in our B5 and our industrial zoned areas. If you allow a usage such as a car wash on Granada, you're setting a precedent that would open up Granada to all those other uses. Every city in Florida is required to do a comp plan. The comp plan is intended as a guide to local governing policies and zoning decisions. It is a roadmap for the city and it includes a multitude of areas from capital improvements, recreation and open space, transportation to future land use. From the comp plan flow our land development code and our city ordinances. The comp plan is the controlling document of a city and it takes precedence, please let me say that, precedent over the land development code. In zoning challenges, Florida law mandates that the comp plan provisions overrule zoning provisions. As Mr. Hayes stated at the planning board meeting last month, all development must by law be consistent with the comp plan and the land development codes. It is the conclusion of your staff that the ROR land use doesn't allow a car wash. And this application is not consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. We've got a great staff and we rely on them so much. And when they tell you that the usage is not compatible with the comp plan, I think we should back them up. If one wants to make changes to the comp plan, which you can do, then there's a process that needs to be adhered to. It can be lengthy and complicated process. And that's done for a really good reason, so that the comp plan cannot be arbitrarily changed. We want Mr. Holub to succeed. Please let me just say this. We want Mr. Holub to succeed in securing quality businesses. It is important to Mr. Holub as it is to our city. However, you, when Mr. Holub submitted his plans for Thank the you, car Rita. wash. Thank you, Rita. Linda Williams is up next. Okay. If I give it to you, I gotta give it to everybody. Hello, Linda Williams, 131 Bozarvi. Um, I, I just appreciate so much what Rita said. It was just, there's nothing much else to say, but I will say that it's already been established through OB Life, what the citizens who attended were asking for. There's no way to overlook that in making this decision. And this is from your paperwork. Residents really value the character of Ormond Beach the small town feel, friendliness and sense of community, closeness to nature, either in the form of accessible natural resources such as the beach, the river or conservation areas, or in the form of the beauty of the trees and landscaping of the community. So I think you have to listen to this. You invited this, you got the feedback, and this is what the citizens said. Since our comprehensive plan does not allow for this industrial car wash to be built in the area being designated for it and has not been approved by your own planning board, planning director, this would seem like an easy decision to make. However, at the planning board meeting, a tactic was used to offer two false choices, citing the car wash as the lesser of two evils, claiming it would be better bet environmentally to have the drive to have the drive through car wash than the proposed drive through restaurants. This rationality is irrational. I do not want to hear us wrangling about that again. That went on at the board meeting for a long time, which was the lesser of the two evils. We don't have to accept that. You're in power, and that false logic should not be used for this. This should be an easy decision if you wish to respond to the will of the citizens, your comprehensive plan, the planning board, and your planning director. Do you want to respect that or the will of the developer? Thank you. Thank you. Travis Sargent. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Good evening. My name is Travis Sargent, 406 North Beach Street. The 
residents of Warren Beach are fortunate to have developers such as Mr. Jones and Mr. Holub, to name a few. My family and I enjoy, <clears throat> excuse me, being able to walk from our house to Granada to grab coffee, maybe lunch, maybe dinner. We have these options because developers have taken risks to invest in our city. Now Mr. Holub is bringing, <clears throat> bringing in a high-end gas station that is known for being clean, having great food, and competitive uh, gas prices. What would best be, uh, what would complement this best than a high-end car wash? I did a Google search of uh, Cloud 10 car wash. All the reviews are high. It's a great car wash. It would be a great place for this to be. As you drive down Granada, uh, some personal services, you have 14 options for fast food, six dry cleaners, five gas stations, not including the Wawa. We only have one car wash, Sparkle and Shine. The one at, uh, excuse me, the one at Shell hasn't worked in years. And the other one is a do-it-yourself and has a touchless option, which doesn't get your car clean. I go to Sparkle and Shine once a week and would love another option. Please approve this request. Thank you. Thanks. So much. Ed Kaloska. Ed Kalaska, The Trails. Let me put this as simple and as straightforward as possible. The residents of Warman Beach do not want, nor do they need, a gas station at Granada Point. The residents of Warman Beach do not want, nor do they need, a car wash at Granada Point. The residents of Warman Beach do not want, nor do they need, a traffic light at Granada Point. Furthermore, the architecture and style of the two structures the gas station and the car wash do not complement any other structures, including commercial, office, business, and definitely not residential, <clears throat> between Orchard Avenue and Nova Road and the area due south of the site, Granada Point. In addition, do we not already have three gas stations and three car washes one mile due east of Granada Point? This trifecta is not in the best interest of the community. This is not progress. This merely satisfies the, grat satisfies the gratification of one individual. The reason we are here tonight is to express, the reason we're here tonight to express our objections to these three items, specifically the car wash, is due to improper zoning of the site known as Granada, Pipe, Granada Point. In fact, tonight the commission is to vote on the six amendments to the initial plan presented by the developer. Why should there be any alterations to the plan? Is this common practice where the original proposal, which is granted formal approval, comes back for modifications, especially after major development work has already been completed, including lopping down every tree in sight? Is it possible that some or all of these afterthoughts may not have been approved at the initial hearing had they been presented at that time? If the developer can make a request to alter the original agreement, why can't we, the residents of Warman Beach, make a counter request to void the original plan and the amendments? As stated earlier, we do not want, nor do we need, a gas station, a car wash, or a traffic light at Granada Point. The two former items are not yet in the ground. The traffic light we will tolerate as a non-functioning metal monolith to remind our future generations of past political mistakes. The purpose of the traffic light was solely to appease Wawa as it, as it is a requirement for their site locations. In itself, the light serves no functional use as Tomoka Avenue and Granada Boulevard is not a major intersection. The City Commission is faced with the dilemma of voting against the recommendations of these two, the two review panels and especially the residents of Warman Beach or voting against the benefactor. It would be a shame if the once again 5-0 decision in favor of the developer was made in advance of this meeting. In fact, reality demands a 5-0 vote against the car wash to support the residents of Warman Beach and the two review boards. Why bother having a planning review panel if you're not going to pay heed to their logic? Bottom line, the commission has got to decide between backing the residents of Warman Beach or appeasing the developer. Do not ignore the earlier suggestion to avoid the com comment. With the green grass covering the site, it would All be right, a Mr. good Mr. your time has expired. Thank you. And Ken Sipes will All be right. next.
Good evening, Good evening. Commission. My name is Ken Sipes, 355 Applegate Landing, representing citizens and neighbors dedicated to Ormond Beach. We are troubled by the new request on Granada Point. Uh, as a special request, a car wash is not a project that enhances the area. It's going to pose problems for traffic, air quality, and the lack of good jobs. There are already car washes on near, uh, US 1, and uh, so there's some on Nova. Uh, the intersections of uh, Granada and US 1, along with Granada and Nova, are two of the most accident-prone areas of Volusia County. Uh, the strip has heavy traffic now, and uh, this project is just going to add to that. Uh, this area of town is a tale of two Granadas. On the north side, we have the office and professional development, uh, which is more desirable than the south side, represented by gas station, car wash, or drive throughs This is the lowering of our city standards. This is any town USA in the making. Our city standards are supposed to guide us to be uh, consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. We do not see this happening here, and a car wash doesn't fit in. This project is in the center of our town and on our main thoroughfare, and it's being cheapened. Car washes have been around since the 1940s. Fact is, they've always been uh, treated as automotive uh, services is a proper one. Volusia County also classifies it as auto care. Changing the comprehensive plan to uh, approve car washes, that's going to open a Pandora's box for Granada, lowering the standards more, all for a car wash. Uh, we would uh, hope that the healthy tree number 19 can be saved in a responsible way. This tree deserves the utmost care. Its roots must be properly protected. Ormond Beach City Code Section 3-04 addresses proper protections. Our hope is that they are enforced. We are asking the city to consider bonding the tree, which is a common practice. So in conclusion, the small town charm and environment are still valued by the citizens of Ormond Beach. And I thank you for my time. Thank you. Mary Churchill. Churchill? Okay. Ronald Novisky. All right. And Susan Neff. Okay. Bob Rinforth. Bob, you're up. Good evening, city staff, commissioners, and mayor. Mr. Mayor, my name is Robert Rinforth, and I live at 97 South Ridgewood Avenue. I'm just grateful I didn't have to follow this young lady over in the end of the seat there. She's the one that knows what she's talking about. So my message to you is your, your staff in the city denied this. The planning board denied it. And I'm encouraging you to deny the car wash. And Rita, if you would like to take a few minutes of my time, I'd like to give a few minutes to her if that's possible. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't work that way. But thank you, Bob. Mark or Paul, whoever wanted to have some rebuttal time, hopefully, hopefully briefly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, Paul, Paul has a couple comments he wants to wrap up with, but I'll just be brief. You know, you you've heard a lot. Of, I mean, obviously, a lot of comments about the proposed use. Um, you are the ultimate arbiter here um, in the in the context of a rezoning, or in this case, an amendment to an existing zoning. Your, your job is to look at the facts of the particular case and determine whether or not it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. 
Um, I, I respect what you know what the staff analysis uh, you know concluded. Um, again, I, I point back to the, the, the comment in the staff analysis that said there's never been policy direction given with regard to whether this is an appropriate thing to include into the ROR classification. Um, you know, I think that based on the intensity of the use, the, the design and the, and the way that this fits into the overall mix of the uses there, the fact that the uh, convenience store type C already includes this use and kind of pulls it into the development, like there are a number of reasons why you can consider it. You know, again, Paul mentioned uh, when we were talking about the convenience store uh, type C being included in the original development that that was determined to be a retail use. You have the latitude and the ability to look at this and determine that it is a retail use that is consistent with the, the retail use permitted under the ROR. Um, I fully you know, understand and respect what you know the the uh, position that's, that staff took that you know hey you, you have automotive services that traditionally have been treated different. But again, I think things change and things evolve. And the nature of this type of use, the, 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 the quiet type of operation, the enclosed type of operation, changes the character. Um, and, and you have the ability, and, the, and I think in, in this case, the justification to find that it, it is something different than what it's been treated as in the past. So Paul, do you want to make any other additional comments? Mr. Mayor, Commission, I'll be very brief. Uh, first of all, if I had the vision to include the car wash under the original development order and a fast food was not on this site and I was coming before you tonight to put in a 24 hour, which is approved in, uh, by right, crystals or 24 hour church's fried chicken or Sonics, you would have more people here tonight and you'd have to set up seats outside. I'd never envisioned this type of facility. I didn't know they existed. I did not know they could afford the land cost of our of Granada and the development cost. And quite honestly, you know, we have had opportunities with different types of fast food for, for this project, not just on this parcel, but on others. Some of them I've rejected because it's not what I want to build. That's, I'm going to keep a, a portion of this project. It's not what I want to have in my project, in my community. I did not accept this contract from this group without a lot of negotiation in regard to architecture, landscape, and hours of operation. If it's in my contract, it's gonna be in my condo docs that they can't have any outside detail and things like that. So we didn't just take this contract in eight months ago. And all of the things that Ms. Schreiber talked about, I hope we get those too. If we build a shopping center there, we'll have a lot of those uses in that center. No one in this community has provided more business opportunities, more retail space, more office professional, medical, dental than, than I have, have provided more opportunities for small business people in this community. I finance some of the small business, the business opportunities in this community. In 33 years, we've built more than anybody else. We've given more opportunities for small business, and we, and we, we embrace that. I hope we do end up with a lot of the uses that she talks about um, in her survey. And I gotta just tell you too, the environmental side of this, and, and we talk about water, and water's a big issue. And it is a fact, it, it's not propaganda. They're gonna wash approximately 146,000 cars a year. They're gonna buy about a million, a million, 600,000 600, gallons of water from the city. It does get recycled and then it gets discharged and they, you know, they recycle it three or four or five times. If all those cars were washed at home, it's 10,300,000 gallons and it's based on scientific studies. It's not something I'm making up. That's eight and a half million gallons difference. And we're always talking about our water in our, in our community, how precious it is. So I would ask you to consider all the points. The, 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 the complaint issue, the commission approved it before the use is already there. We just don't want to build another gas station to put in another to put in a car wash. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, commission, it now comes to us for uh, motions, seconds, uh, votes, and discussion. I, I'd like to propose that we there's six amendments as part of this. If Randy will allow it, I'd like to propose we take two through uh, six, take care of them first because I th think there 
could be agreement on those two through five would be approved as recommended coming to us with unanimous approval from the uh, planning board six would be a denial again with a unanimous vote of the planning board um, and so two through six we could dispose of fairly quickly and then number one is the car wash which I think will take some more discussion but Randy is there a I think the planning board handled it that way. Is there a practical way to yeah, do that? Um, there, there are any number of ways you can do that. You may want to get an underlying motion and a second on the floor, and then you can treat each of these individually if you want, or you can handle it this way and then come back to the underlying motion. So uh, you've got some discretion in terms of how you want to handle that. Is there a motion as to... Uh, I like to okay. Well, let's start with uh, two then and roll right through to six and then we'll go back to one is there a motion on number two so move second second any discussion amendment two is the allowing privacy walls to range from a minimum of six feet in height to a maximum of eight feet in height I, i'll speak mayor yes sir. <clears throat> I think this is, excuse me, I think this is sort of a no-brainer. I've had res residents sort of complain that it's not eight feet tall all, or, all the way around, and it's only six feet in a portion. Um, so I think eight foot is, fi is fine. Any other discussion? Lisa, please call the vote. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. Now we move to Amendment 3, removing the required easement for eight future parking spaces on the north parcel of the planned business development that was approved for the benefit of the three chimneys property. I need a motion and a move second. Move approval. I second the motion. Any discussion? Lisa, please call the vote as to Amendment 3. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. Now we're on Amendment 4, modifying the required 10,000 contribution to the Ormond Beach Historical Society from the construction of a walkway for pedestrian access to the Three Chimneys Historical Site to allow use of the contribution for the repair and maintenance of the Three Chimneys Historic Property. Sub move. I second the motion. Any discussion? Lisa, please call the vote on Amendment 4. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. Now we're on Amendment 5, which clarifies that two out parcels are permitted on, that's two TW0, TWO, uh, on Unit 4 of the planned business development contingent upon the out parcels meeting the minimum requirements of the planned business development and the land development code. Just need a motion and a second. I move for approval. Second. Any discussion? Lisa, please call the vote on Amendment 5. Com Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And Amendment 6 is a requested approval for the removal of historic tree number 19 on the north parcel of the planned business development. Just need a motion and a second on Amendment 6. Mr. Mayor, I don't know that you're going to get a motion because it would be approval for that. So you mind me asking, Mr. Hayes, Mr. Hayes, what's the best way to do this if we're going to say no to removing this tree? Just make a... Would um, that be a, just, a, just a, a generic motion and then voting it down? Just a, just a motion to deny the removal of the trees. We'll, we'll be sufficient for this, for this part. Mr. Mayor, I would make that motion to, to change the wording so that we deny the motion to uh, remove this historic tree on this parcel. Second. For the request, yes. Second. Right. You're happy with that, Randy? To deny. Got it. Yes, All right. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Mayor, briefly. Mayor and I'm pleased that the applicant said that they were going to take that off the table because this is a beautiful tree. And, you know, it was just our last meeting. We received our 27th year of being a Tree City USA. And, um, you okay? <laughs> So anyway, Mr. Mayor, I just I, I think that it's extremely appropriate to save that tree. Understood. Anyone else? Lisa, please call the vote. Commissioner Persis. Yes. Commissioner Littleton. Yes. Commissioner Kent. Yes. Mayor Partington. Yes. And now we are on Amendment 1 to allow a car wash as a permitted use under certain conditions within the Granada Point 
plan business development. <clears throat> the conditions would include hours of operations limited to 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, there'll be architectural upgrades to the building design, no outside detailing on site, and the vacuum system would operate only during car wash operational hours. That is amend Amendment 1. Move for approval of Amendment 1. Mr. Mayor, before, before there's a second, you, you read that and you said that it would be until, I think, 9 p.m. I thought there was a change. You're right, now that I read further. Amended to 8 p.m. Okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure I, I heard everyone correctly. Is the maker of the motion, are you, are you okay with that? Yes, I acknowledge it's 8 p.m. Second for discussion, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Little. Thank you, Mayor. For discussion. Yep. So I met with the developer, and I discussed that uh, if this car wash was going to have a negative effect via sound on the residents, I couldn't support it. And uh, through the research that I did on Google and the reports provided, uh, it's absolutely going to have no problem with sound. Uh, residents are going to be more likely to hear the waterfall than they will the car wash. The next issue comes, and the big one, comes to the use of the property. Is it consistent and appropriate? So my typical drive is Hand Avenue at US-1 to Granada, Granada to Timber Creek, Williamson to Hand, and uh, Nova to where I live. There's like five car washes there. And take a guess on how close the car washes are to gas stations. Two of them are connected. One of them's not working, the shell. And the other two are within... 100 feet or walking distance within the car washes or the gas stations. So the use is appropriate in my eyes. Matter of fact, it's expected. I would, it seems to me, consumers want there to be car washes next to gas stations. Uh, you know, if you're, if you were against the whole project and the gas station in the beginning, you're going to be against this now, and I understand. But I see no problem with the use being a, of a car wash. Matter of fact, I think it's appropriate, and I hope it serves the citizens of Ormond Beach well to have an environmentally friendly car wash on Granada. Thank you. Commissioner, are you ready? Sure. Deputy Mayor Kent. Yeah, uh, Planning Director, question for you. So we heard from the applicant that, that stated that um, if the gas station wanted to put a car wash there, they could. Is that is that true? They could do it as an accessory use. So, so that automobile or convenience type C allows a accessory use vehicle wash. Right, and that, so, and that could and that could happen without coming before this commission again? Correct, but basically the accessory use could be no greater than 50% of the total right. square footage of the, and they would have to be used by the gas station. Right, and and uh, if, if I, my memory is correct, it was like the accessory use for this one could be like three, for, or for the Wawa, could have been like 3,200 square feet. Correct, assuming the Wawa is running the, ga the uh, right. vehicle wash. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Um, yeah. I have I have a question for um, Randy. Is everything you've heard is and we we keep hearing that it's not in the land development code and it's not in the comp plan. Can you speak about that? Because I'm a li I'm a little confused. <laughs> Join the club. Um, <laughs> the um, no, I'm I'm not confused. I didn't mean it that way. <clears throat> Uh, let me try to circle back to the to the beginning for the foundational purposes. Your planning director is the official the official interpreter interpreter of the code. The the um, applications and the uses have to be consistent with the comp plan number one, and then the uses have to be consistent with the zoning district um, in in the area in, in question. The um, the planning director um, has concluded. Uh, in his opinion that this particular use as a standalone car wash is not uh, allowed under the cur current uses uh, under the land development code and he stated the reasons f for that um, it's it's um, challenging to compare this use to other existing uses that were approved 
many years ago under different standards, uh, including uh, the accessory uses to existing gas stations. And, and it, kind of, it kind of muddles what you have before you this, this evening. Um, those accessory uses are allowed as part of a retail component. And those uses are limited in, in the amount of size um, and, and the spacing. And what the planning director has indicated in his analysis is that uh, as part of the overall PBD development order, uh, a convenience um, store, um, a gas station, would allow as an accessory use a car wash. That's not what you have here. So it's kind of a technical distinction. Um, what the applicant is saying is that the car wash is a car wash regardless of whether it's accessory or primary and therefore this this commission has the discretion from a policy perspective to make that determination. The planning board <clears throat> was split on the issue. Um, they voted in favor of, of uh, accepting the planning director's um, um, staff analysis uh, to deny this particular use. They did not feel that it was um, consistent, that it was not allowable use within this particular zoning area and it wasn't, was not consistent with the comp plan. What this commission would need to do is to articulate, if, if it wanted to support uh, uh, this number one uh, uh, amendment, is to articulate in the record um, the basis on which you believe this use is different uh, from a policy perspective from the traditional types of car washes. One way that the applicant has suggested to you is that it's more akin to a, a retail use. And one of the other uses that was discussed at the planning board was it's more akin to a, a personal service type of use. Um, from a policy perspective, you can make those distinctions, um, but you need to um, state in the record the basis why you're making those decisions because your planning staff is going to need clear direction from this point forward how to uh, handle other applications that may come before you. Um, and I don't know, Stephen, if you want to add anything to that or not. I don't know if that specifically addressed your question. It's not an easy question to answer. No. So, um, and I don't know if I did a very good job, uh, frankly. Um, so zoning isn't like math. There's, there's no two plus two equals four. Mm -hmm. um, so under the land use categories there's retail there's office and there's heavy commercial so the retail coincide with the b4 b5 b7 b8 zoning districts and that's how the wawa gas station was allowed in this basically there was already retail components that are allowed on your comprehensive plan you're selling goods and services as part of the gas station so what the applicant is doing is taking that accessory use and then bringing in a whole principal use so in the B1, B9, and B10 zoning districts, those are associated with the, re the residential office retail land uses. And, and those, in staff's opinion, don't allow the heavy commercial uses, which are typically allowed in your heavy commercial and industrial zoning. Those are the B5 and the I1 zoning district. So those are the kind of three different categories and why staff didn't believe it was consistent. Okay, thank you, thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. And I just want to say, listen, listening to everyone tonight, I, I hear so much, you know, caring on, on both sides, both sides of this issue, because I know, I know we all love our city and we want the best for our city. And I have to say, I think Paul Holub has done amazing things for this city, just absolutely amazing. And it, it really hurts me when I hear someone say something negative about him. But on the other hand, because the planning board has denied this, and it's not in the comprehensive plan, I don't feel like I, I can vote for it. So I'm very torn sitting right here. So this is very difficult for me. But um, so based on what I'm hearing now, my vote would be no. Okay. Well, let me take a swing at uh, explaining why my vote is yes. And uh, I think the Basically, staff hasn't had the benefit of the commission giving them policy direction anytime recently on where a car wash would be appropriate in the, um, in the scheme of the comprehensive plan or the land development code. 
and I understand, Randy, this is a policy decision where the buck stops here. This commission gets to make that decision ultimately. And things have changed through the years with how car washes uh, not only look, but operate. When I was a kid, you'd go to the car wash every weekend and you'd take out the wand and it's a big long bay after bay after bay after bay and then you'd wash your car and that is not appealing visually from the road so I could understand at the time why something like that would go into a, a B5 commercial heavy district uh, or an industrial zone or out at the airport um, other areas where industrial uses go um, but times have changed um, you know we've seen the morph into sparkle and shine and what that has turned into uh, that's more like what car washes are and then now we have the no touch tunnel basically which is uh, even a new incarnation of what the what the car wash has become and to me that is more akin to a, a service or retail use. You, you pull in, you pay your money, you get your product and you leave. And your product is the car wash. And so that's why uh, I think it's appropriate in this instance to allow it, uh, you know, it's allowed already as an accessory use. Um, I think it almost should be allowed maybe as a special exception um, or a permitted use with certain conditions but uh, you know if you're gonna ultimately amend either our, the LDC or the comp plan to uh, to have consistency I don't know which of those you would really look at to me the special exception makes more sense because then you still have the ability to attach conditions and uh, in order to control how it looks and whether it fits in a certain area, I think you want the ability to attach those conditions to it. So um, I think the fact that the car wash use is already allowed as an accessory use to the gas station is a, a big factor that weighs on me based on the, uh, you know, relying on the testimony that's been presented, also the materials uh, submitted by staff and in uh, materials submitted by the applicant. Uh, the fact that weighs heavily, heavily on me was the resident who lived just on the other street. And he pointed out that it's a lower traffic generator, you know, only 20% of the traffic of what a Crystals or a Sonic or one of those other places would provide. So everything else being equal, I'm always going to go for the project that has less impact on our residents, particularly ones that live close by. And I think this, this does have less impact and it's an appropriate use. Uh, the car wash has plenty of stacking capacity. There's a wall screening it from the rear on Tomoka Avenue. There's quite a bit of buffer and landscape screening on the front facing Granada Boulevard. Uh, the fact that there's not going to be any detailing of cars, uh, only three to four employees, and it's a no-touch system. And Randy, I just I want you to comfort me that it's not going to morph into a, a sparkle and shine somewhere down the road. Well, you ha you have enough conditions in here to prevent those types of activities on site from occurring. <clears throat> so, so that that part uh, I can confirm for you. With if that's what your, the, your question goes to. That is, thank you. Uh, the environmental uh, aspects, I think, speak for themselves. The noise studies that were provided and the fact that there will be no noise impact, that's a huge uh, issue for me. With a fast food or other type of restaurant, you have uh, noise from the drive through you have noise from multiple garbage pickups during the week those things won't be issues with this project and um, I already mentioned the increased landscaping there are other communities uh, nice communities that allow these types of buildings in their business retail zoning districts and uh, it's a it's a huge 
investment in our community and it's a, a top of the line building with architecture I think that's going to complement the overall uh, project let me uh, As far as the other uh, criteria, just to make sure the record is clear, uh, there are nine criteria for approval. And really, number one and number three through nine, I don't see any issues with. I think there's been plenty of testimony and information provided by everybody to, to satisfy those. And in fact, three through nine staff uh, does not point out any issues with uh, with those criteria. The only issues they do have uh, issues with are number one, the proposed development conforms to, and I'm going through these issues off of uh, staff's packet, which is page 14 through 21 is where it starts criteria for approval. Number one, the proposed development conforms to the standards and requirements of this code and will not create undue crowding beyond the conditions normally permitted in the zoning district or adversely affect the public health, safety, welfare, or quality of life. And I think that is satisfied by the information presented about no noise impacts, uh, less traffic impacts. It clearly satisfies that. Uh, and then number two is whether the development is consistent with the comprehensive plan and again I don't fault staff with their recommendation going on a on a code that hasn't been amended in any time in the recent past and also has not had the benefit of any policy direction from the Commission as far as how that works but I really don't think uh, this use is going to be bad in any way I think it's appropriate I think it fits in that area you look at the uh, lube place that we go to all the time to get our oil changed which is just a quarter mile up the street there's no issue with that that is the bays that is automotive use uh, pep boys the tire place um, Granada Goodyear there um, all of those things work well and cause no issues on Granada Boulevard. The Shell gas station with the car wash was in service for years. Nobody ever had a problem with that. Uh, it was a, a convenience. Of course, it hasn't worked in the last year, year, year and a half, but I don't think that's been an issue. And uh, the need for additional car wash facilities, I think is the testament to that is what a success sparkle and shine has turned into and how difficult it is with cars stacking on us one and tomoka avenue to get in there on a frequent basis uh, and how busy they are and the fact that they i think they opened up another or are going to open up another location out on lpga shows that there's a demand for that service so all of those things uh, taken into account i think i've fairly well covered the record randy was there anything else that that you think I needed to touch on? No, no sir. Procedurally, uh, I just vote uh, for approval on this amendment one, and then we'll come back and get a motion and second on the underlying motion um, to approve amendment one with the conditions that you stated into the record, um, then amendments two through five, and then denial on um, amendment number six, which was um, um, the removal of the historic tree. All right. Anyone else? I know we've each had one shot at or one bite at the apple. Anyone else on a second go around? Want to add anything? Okay. So I just need a motion, I guess, along the lines of what Randy just. Yeah, let's vote first on the amendment one. Uh, approval of that. With the conditions? With the conditions. Is there a, mo a motion? We already have it. I did. And you covered, you covered those. You're right. You did. Okay. Lisa, call the vote. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? No. Mayor Partington? Yes. And now we'll have a motion and second for the underlying measure before you. 
which would include, and I'm kind of, I'm going to state this for you and somebody can adopt it, approval of Amendment 1 with those conditions that the mayor previously stated into the record, approval of Amendments 2 through 5, and denial of uh, Amendment 6, um, which would otherwise have allowed the removal of the tree. In other words, you're going to save the historic tree. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would make that exact motion that our city attorney <laughs> just exactly. laid out. I second Commissioner Ken's motion. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yeah, no, you can do it that way. That easy. Lisa, <laughs> please call the vote. Commissioner Kent. Yes. Commissioner Persis. Yes. Commissioner Littleton. Yes. Mayor Partington. Yes. Thank you, Randy, for your help with that. All right. And that takes care of item uh, number 8E. I thought we did them all. No, we're, we're good there. We're good. Yeah. We'll close the public hearings and move on to item 9A. Ordinance number 2019-6, an ordinance setting forth a proposed amendment to sections 3.03, 3.05, 5.06, and 6.02 of the Charter of the City of Ormond Beach, Florida, by amending terms of office to include staggered four-year terms for city commissioners and for mayor, providing a schedule for staggering the terms of office, providing a procedure for determining a primary election, calling for a municipal referendum election to be held by mail ballot, providing for severability, repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof, and setting forth an effective date. This is ordinance number 2019-6, read by title only. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I have a few cards and we will start with Joe Hanoush. Joe Noosh, um, I'm a voter, resident, and taxpayer at 87 Carriage Creek Way. Um, frankly, I don't like any of this. This is, none of this benefits the residents of Orem Beach, and in fact, I think it goes against the residents of Orem Beach. The staggered four-year terms halves the opportunity that the voters in Orem Beach have to vote for who they want representing them. The primary process, it moved the elections up to the point where more voters generally don't don't vote, and it takes the opportunity away from folks that would uh, the candidates that would not otherwise have a voice. Um, I know if I ran for state house last year, so I'm wearing the shirt here. <laughs> I, I came in third, so if I would have been in this kind of uh, way, if it does pass. I would not have had the opportunity to voice my message to the voters uh, through the general election. I would not have had the opportunity to um, participate in hobnobs and uh, candidate forums here in Ormond. Um, I, I don't think it's a proper way to address this issue via mail-in ballot. Uh, the city commission elections happen during the general election, or at least the primary if that happens. Uh, certainly not mail-in ballots. So I don't think voting on this should be done in that way. Um, and if it's going to happen, <laughs> which I don't hope it doesn't happen, uh, I would hope at least term limits would be on the table or at least presented on this if it's going to happen. That way, you know, we just get everything out of the way of how the voters would want to do it if we do it. And again, I'm against it. <laughs> um, it it's already so difficult for challengers, if you will, to defeat, again, if you will, um, incumbents. And we saw that last year. The four incumbents are still sitting up there. Uh, it's, and it was double digit um, you know, point percentages. I understand the you know, under 50% thing. I think there's a better way to address that. I think a ranked choice voting or approval voting would be better, again, during the general election. Um, Another thing, uh, we, we always say, I always hear from you guys that Warren Beach does it right, and we do. And I want us to continue doing it right way when it comes to our elections. I loved it. Um, I think it was a great process, at least from this point of view. <laughs> I got to enjoy it, and I, I, and I hope it continues. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> David Bueno or Buono? 
Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come up here and uh, put in my and some of my um, citizens from Ormond Beach some of their concerns. On behalf of Ormond citizens I have spoken with, I am here tonight to address issues regarding ordinance number 2019-6, staggered four-year terms for city commissioners and for mayor. Firstly, I would like to address this proposition that would allow <coughs> the terms to be extended to four years. The, there is a great consensus that four-year terms for a city commission are not in the best interest of our citizens and actually are an erosion of the people's power to govern. Two-year terms are correct. Here are some reasons why. Point one. Many changes can and will happen in this city in two years, certainly more in four years. The citizens, we the people, if need be, should hold the power to make changes in their representatives after two years. Point B. The city manager and staff are the main body that advise the commission. Therefore, the commissioners and the mayor are representatives of the people and the people should have the power to change them in two years versus four years to exercise accountability. Point C. The Florida State House and the United States House of Representatives both have two-year terms to hold these members accountable to the people. Our commission need not have less accountability. Point D. Ormond Beach is the city that has the correct term limits, unlike many municipalities in the local area. We can be a leader for the people to demonstrate accountability in the county and beyond. Secondly, I would like to address the process of staggered terms. This process is completely undemocratic and certainly erodes control of the people's elected officials. The idea that only three people would be up for election or re-election at a time, then two next time on a rotating basis would not give the citizens an opportunity to re-elect or remove the full commission and mayor. The citizens, we the people, deserve better, much better indeed. In closing, the citizens of Ormond Beach encourage you to take these points into serious consideration. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, Linda Williams. I have to first say I'm heart sick at what happened here tonight. You did not listen to the citizens. On fair elections. And I, I know you don't care, but it makes me want to just drop out of trying to make changes. I'm happy that you would like to include on the ballot the issue that a candidate running for office in Ormond Beach must receive 51% of the vote or face a runoff, which will require primary at the next election. Does this have to be voted on? Seems like that should be a given in order to have fair elections from the get-go. But I am happy that you want to do this, Mayor Partington. I appreciate that, and I heard you express that at the last meeting. I disagree that we need to vote on moving to, uh, to vote on the idea of moving to four-year terms. If I understand your recommendation correctly, in order to that it was in order to protect the city of Ormond Beach in case the voters decide to clean house and everyone voted in is new. I understand from reading our um, um, that this is your logic. I, I believe this is false logic, just like the false logic that was used to vote on the previous thing. Our city charter states that um, the city manager is making decisions 
uh, based on your appointed boards, et cetera, and your guidance. But it clearly states the city manager employees uh, run the city and you do not have the power to take over the manager's duties. So these will be fully in place and running efficiently as it does now with Ms. Shanahan in charge should you all be voted out at once. I've talked with a number of her employees and feel great confidence that they could continue running the city efficiently if something like that should happen. Um, if you continue with this tact and insist on putting this discretionary wish on the ballot, I understand from our charter that when there are issues being voted on, all issues have to be separated and given separate numbers on the ballot. Um, in other words, you cannot just uh, combine the above issues into one vote according to our charter chapter 13 article 4 section 1333 ballot language so if you are going to put these both issues on the ballot they have to be separated out so people can vote separately on them according to our charter thank you thank you <laughs> George Ann Meadows Hello, good evening. I'm George Ann Meadows. I live on Lindenwood Circle. Um, I'm against uh, I'm against the idea of the city commissioners having four year terms. Throughout my career as a government contractor, I had annual performance evaluations and um, these were reviews with my boss and I don't think it's un unreasonable for the city commissioners to be evaluated every two years by the people that hired them. Thank you. Thank you. Julie Sipes. Good evening, Commission. I'm Julie Sipes of 355 Applegate Landing and co-founder of Citizens and Neighbors dedicated to Ormond II. We support keeping the two-year terms for the Commission. As far as we know, there has been no public outcry to change to four-year terms. Also, we oppose this particular primary proposal. We support primaries which result in runoff elections, but because of low turner vote or turnout, we do not believe primaries should be used as a final determinant as to who serves on the city commission. Here's a brief history and the reasons to stick with two-year terms. Except for elections 1995 through 1999, city's history has been two-year terms. Um, <clears throat> Four-year terms lessen Two-year terms are in place for the U.S. Congress and Florida legislatures. Four-year terms lessen accountability to voters. Unless unopposed, incumbents must engage voters every two years. City voters approved extended, staggered four-year terms in 1993. In a second referendum in 1999, voters restored two-year terms. In 2005, a third commission referendum, voters reject, rejected four-year terms. In no, the 1993 question asked, should the city commission be elected to alternating four-year terms? We believe this wording misled voters to believe we already had four-year terms. In 1999, clearer wording helped voters restore two-year terms. After 2010, the election requirement of 50% plus one was dropped, removing primary elections for seats with more than two candidates and substituting a plurality requirement as occurred in 2018. In the past 20 years, no one in the city suggested four-year terms until a citizen at the, po at the podium at a January meeting and, a, and a, su a suggestion to the mayor at the Rotary Club by a member. The mayor heard one citizen at a public meeting but has not heard hundreds of us asking to save wetlands, trees, and history. That includes um, Mayor Partington. All the letters I wrote about low-impact development to you and others over the past five, 10, 
15 years. <sighs> Lastly, I agree with the gentleman who spoke about that an initiative this important should not be decided through a mail ballot. If the commission believes citizens want this referendum, it should, be prop it should properly be scheduled for the 22 regular election when candidates can run for or against four-year terms. Thank you. Thank you. Rich Cooper. Rich. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioner, staff. Good evening. My name is Rich Cooper. I'm a community enthusiast and advocate, and I'm here this evening as the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are in support of Ordinance 2019-6, and I'd like to read a letter of support on behalf of that. The Government Affairs Committee and the Executive Board of Directors of the Ormond Beach Chamber of Commerce, in accordance with the guidelines and policies of the said committees, have approved and hereby recommend the following changes to the voting requirements for the mayor and four city commissioners of the city of Ormond Beach as follows. Term limits. Anyone serving the commission shall be limited to serving three four-year terms. In addition, for any position, appointment to, that, to a position to fill out a term of another commission member shall not count against the three-year term limit. Service on the commission shall not count against service of a candidate for mayor. Election term. The cha change the current two-year term of the mayor and commissions to four years. Staggered election cycle. Stagger the terms to allow for the election of the mayor and two commissioners during one election cycle with the election of the remaining two commissioners to occur two years later in the next election. Primary election. A primary to be held in accordance with county election schedules if more than two candidates run for any position. Should no one candidate receive 50% or more of the votes, the top two votes, vote earners will have a runoff in the general election. If only two people run for a position, the election shall occur in the general election. We feel at the chamber that this is the best way to advocate for and protect our commission, our staff, and most importantly, the citizens that live, work, and play in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Russell Bennett. Russell Bennett. Okay. All right. Now it comes to us for a, uh, just need a motion and a second for discussion purposes. I move to approve ordinance number 2019-06. I second the motion. Right. Any discussion? First Mayor. Commissioner Littleton. Uh, there were a lot of arguments to keep two-year terms and a few of them were very good. And uh, I would hope that you make the arguments to your citizens during this vote. Um, I could make several arguments from a campaign and an incumbency perspective as why I would prefer two-year terms. And then some people could make an argument as why they would prefer four-year terms. Um, either way, if the citizens want us to have staggered four-year terms and a primary, I say give them the chance to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Anyone else? Are you ready to go? I'll go last. Sure. Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. So um, my first election with you, Mayor Partington, you were commissioner over there in Zone 4. We had a primary. 2003, big race. 2005, there was a primary. And I think we went to get on the right, correct cycle so that we would at least be on, on a presidential year. So I think it was 2008, there was a primary. 2010 was our last primary. So I've not had any constituents ask me for any changes to what we currently have. Zero. And when we ask this question of our bosses, which are the citizens of Ormond Beach, um, I'll, I'll read the results in a moment, but I had a, 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 a woman 
in the community look at me and say, I'll be happy to give you a four-year term, Commissioner Kent. I'll vote for you this term, and in two years, if I like what you do, I'll vote for you again. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. I've, ne I've, I've never forgotten that. And I've never forgotten who, who I answer to and who I represent, ever. But let me tell you what problems I see with a, a primary election, okay? August primaries are typically, typically we have a 30% turnout in our city. While in November, we have between 65% and back in 2008, 80% turnout in our city. Okay? August primaries tend to skew toward partisan favor depending on which party has the most races on that particular ballot. So if you've got more Republicans on the ballot, it may skew towards them. And if you have more Democrats, it may skew towards them in a primary. I would hate to see one party candidate have an advantage because the other party's ballot didn't generate an equal interest, even though we're nonpartisan. Also, independent voters are most often the ones not voting in August. This move would potentially disenfranchise them, not to mention people who tend to take summer vacations. With qualifying in June, our city voters currently get over four months to learn about their commission candidates and meet their candidates. Sometimes the August primary is in early or mid-August, and that could mean as little as six weeks between qualifying and voting. It was August 14th in 2012. Not a lot of time for voters to vet their candidate before choosing. Now, about 10 years ago, this is the exact question that went before our citizens in Ormond Beach. And I'm going to read it verbatimly how it was in the ballot box in 2008. Question three. Shall sec section 5.06 of the city charter be amended? Question mark. The proposed amendment would require candidates to run against each other in a regular election in November of each even numbered year. The candidate receiving the most votes in said election shall be declared the winner without the need for a runoff election. And the outcome of a tie vote shall be decided by lot. That was the question in 2008 that went before all the citizens in Ormond Beach. So for those of you that weren't here in 2008, I'm going to share a little knowledge with you here about what happened. 73% of the voters chose to vote yes for that question in November in 2008. Not a mixed result. It was overwhelming what they wanted. They want us to have two-year terms, and they don't want a primary. They want everybody that has a say to come out and have their say in November. And to me, that's what it's about. Everybody having an opportunity to share their favor or disfavor for their, their candidate that they like. And, 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 you know, some people want their cake and eat it too. Well, we, we, sure, we're okay with staggered elections, but only two years, and we want to give you term limits, and we want a primary. Yeah, you know, I, I bet. But at the end of the day, every candidate, I'm sorry, every commissioner that's up here that was a candidate, including myself, who, I'll, I'll talk about it, I had 49% of the vote. The guy that got second had 37 Double percentage point difference. So, Mr. Mayor, I've not had one member of, of my community come and ask me for this. I know you have. I appreciate you sharing that. If it goes to the people, I mean, I don't, I don't see how it could hurt. I feel like they spoke loudly and clearly about this question. Yes, it was 11 years ago, you know. But um, 
I like the idea of letting most people have a voice in November. So that's where I am, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I think the uh, citizens of Ormond Beach deserve to vote on this. I think once every decade to go back and check with them just to make sure we're on track. Uh, the Florida League of Cities Center for uh, Municipal Research and Innovation shows statistics as far as the primary issue and you know I think you're right on track with that Deputy Mayor. 68 percent of cities do not hold primary elections probably for the exact same reasons that you've been talking about. Sure. But uh, when it comes to cities, this is statewide, with staggered terms of office, 91% of the cities in Florida do have staggered terms. And when it comes to cities with uh, length of municipal terms, 70% have more than a two-year term. So I think that's something to, uh, to take into account. Also, just looking at Volusia County, 75% of the cities in Volusia County, 14 or I'm sorry, 12 out of 16 have four-year terms, and just a very few don't have four-year terms. And then when it comes to staggered, 87.5% do have staggered terms. So I think there is room for uh, allowing our voters to make the final decision on this. Um, I would probably be inclined to just keep it stagger and extend just that question not I wouldn't really support the primary at this point the only um, thing we haven't heard I think Commissioner Selby provided some written comments and I don't know did somebody want to I've got them okay do you want to hear those want first or you oh, whatever you want me to do that's good no, we'll let good. Commissioner okay. Persis finish up and then we'll hear from uh, yeah. Commissioner Selby no. in absentia I have, um, I have, I think it's a great idea to put this on the ballot for the voters to consider, you know, what they would like to see the term limits or, or terms be staggered or otherwise. I think that's great. I just feel um, we're, we're missing out talking about the upcoming one half cent sales tax that's going to be on this ballot May 1st. And I don't want to put you know, too much emphasis on this versus that because I think um, this is something that's really critical for our city. Um, for every three million dollars we would get to address the needs of our residents, one million more would be paid for by, for by our visitors. So during the Ormond Beach Life meetings, the citizens raised concerns about roads, sidewalks, traffic congestion, flood control, water quality, and infrastructure, which all need improvement in our area. So I think we really need to govern ourselves by what's best for our city's future and the possibility to have these infrastructure issues funded through a sales tax and not a property tax is an opportunity we should not miss. So we really need to be out there really, you know, pounding the pavement about this issue. So I also want to take this time to encourage all residents to go to the city's website to open gov and give your input in selecting project priorities should the half cent sales tax be approved and I sure hope that it is so I have no problem with this being on the ballot and I think the you know the citizens of Ormond Beach would, would need to decide what they would like for for us to what they would like for us to have thank you thank you Commissioner Persis and uh, Lisa if you would read Commissioner Selby's comments yes Mayor Partington, Vice Mayor Kent, and Commissioners Persis and Littleton, I regret that I am not able to be with you tonight due to an industry meeting in Austin, Texas. Here are my thoughts on charter amendments regarding election procedures. I support good government, majority rule, saving money, maximizing turnout, and term limits. Good government is enhanced when it is stable and possesses historical knowledge. Staggering terms help provide continuity in policy and allows for citizen input. Voter turnout is maximized when elections are held in even years, coincidental with federal ele elections. Odd-year elections have very low turnout. By scheduling our elections in even years, they will coincide with presidential and midterm elections, thus saving the city money by avoiding paying for elections in odd number of years. Our current system involves one election and winner take all. It does not allow for a runoff and it does not require the winner to be the selection of a majority of the voters. If five candidates ran for a seat, the winner could, in theory, win with slightly over 20% of the vote, meaning slightly under 80% of the voters selected other candidates. 
I believe winners should capture a majority 50% plus one of the votes. A two election system provides for a runoff if necessary and ensures that the winner always receives at least 50% plus one of the votes. Contrary to the proposal in the agenda package, I recommend the city election be held in August during the state primary election. All races with two or more candidates would be on the ballot. The candidate receiving 50% plus one or more shall be elected. In races without a majority winner, the top two vote getters would go to a runoff during the general election in November. Unopposed candidates shall be elected at the end of qualifying as in the procedure currently. Finally, I support term limits. 12 years, three year four terms, three four year terms seems long enough to me starting with the first four year term in 2020 and 2022 respectively. This assures turnover e eventually. Longer terms is not the objective, but it is necessary to accomplish the other goals articulated above. Thank you for listening. I trust your judgment on this matter and welcome the guidance and input of City Attorney Hayes and City Manager Shanahan. Best wishes, Dwight Selby, Commissioner, Zone 1, City of Ormond Beach. Thank you, uh, Lisa. And now it's back to the commission. Um, anyone else wish to have any further discussion? Mr. Mayor, I would just say, you know, if, if we vote on this the way that this is, th this isn't the um, the way that you presented what you would support. Right. We would need a uh, motion probably deleting the uh, primary segment. I don't know if there's a way to do that, Randy. How would you like to see it? <clears throat> Excuse me. So you would like to eliminate the, um, the primary well, component? Two people saying that. I don't know how strong it okay. is. So that's it. I do not agree with that. I would be fine with it. Okay. So, yeah, we would delete the delay. So that's in section three uh, of the ordinance, um, as well as, uh, let's see here, I believe it's question question two, I think it is. <clears throat> But that's but that's the section that you would want to delete uh, dealing with section It's 5.06 of the charter but it's actually section three uh, of the of the ordinance as proposed so motion to approve absent section three is there a motion i move to approve the motion absent section three okay and, and that would include the question that follows so second understood all right motion and a second any further discussion or questions Lisa, please call the vote. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? No. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. Now we move to item 10, reports, suggestions, and requests. And tonight we start with City Manager Joyce Shanahan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Um, I just wanted to briefly update you on a couple of transportation issues. We've been working with the Florida Department of Transportation regarding um, all of the commission's um, transportation priorities. Uh, specifically, we've learned from um, the Florida Department of Transportation that they have approved uh, pr preliminary design for um, three RRFBs between A1A and Andy Romano Park. Okay. So that's good news. We're still working on them to get the additional requirements of RRFBs from A1A North to um, Ann Ruston. Can you say that again? Three RRFBs between uh, Andy Romano and Granada was Yes. It? Wonderful. That's uh, awesome That's news. great news. That's great news. Great news. Yep. I have even better news. It okay. gets better. Um, <laughs> the second piece of information is that um, the Florida Department of Transportation has agreed to include in their five-year work plan a preliminary design and environmental study for the I-95 US-1 interchange. Um, what we're now working on is trying to get that moved up and then secondarily we're working on trying to get them to budget for design work. Design work for that interchange will be about $500,000. Um, uh, we're looking to see if the s state office and the um, River to Sea TPO can maybe partner together. They may come to us asking us to put some skin in the game so that they know that the city, city is um, committed in that regard. 
So if that's the case, I'll come back to you for that. Uh, you could use your sales tax dollars if that was approved in the future. Um, lastly, they've also approved um, one more uh, step on the uh, I-95 US-1 interchange. One of the first steps you have to do is an interchange justification report. That was started maybe a year and a half ago, but somehow got stalled at FDOT. They have, um, they're close to finalizing that, and that's what helps set us up to get into the five-year work plan for the I-95 interchange. And lastly, they have also agreed to undertake a design study for um, uh, Nova Road, uh, what they call a uh, traffic study analysis. Uh, we have a number of people. There's no crossing from Granada to Wilmette. That's about a little over a mile and a half, not unlike what you have on Beachside. But we have residents at an assisted living facility there. We've got residents at the apartments down by the um, ball field. Uh, people trying to get across um, the road. They don't want to go all the way up to Wilmette or all the way up to Nova Road, I mean to Granada, to cross the street. So um, we all know that the uh, public shopping center and the trails has come to SPRC looking to uh, do some uh, renovations to the publics at the at that uh, shopping center in the trails. So this will be a great opportune time to begin to study that roadway while uh, Publix is redesigning their um, store and building a brand new state-of-the-art store there. So that's some really excellent news um, from, um, from our transportation. And I know that's a big priority for you all, and we've been working hard at that. And um, Lastly, I would take a minute to ask uh, Gabe Menendez to introduce our new uh, utilities um, manager. Good evening. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to introduce, can you stand up please, Robin? Uh, Robin Bain as our new city utility manager. Robin has over 38 years of experience in the public works and, and public utilities field. Her experience ranges from water and wastewater maintenance and operation to water quality regulatory permitting and compliance. She's earned both her master's in science degree in environmental engineering and her bachelor's of science degree in civil engineering from Virginia Tech. <laughs> and Robin is a registered professional engineer in the state of Florida as well as a board certified environmental engineer. So we, we welcome Robin. Hey Robin, welcome. Great to have you, Robin. Welcome, and uh, another great hire, Joyce. Well done, and Gabe. Good deal. All right, uh, Assistant City Manager, Claire Whitley. Welcome, Robin. We're very happy you're here. And uh, that's it, good night. Thank you, good night. Uh, City Attorney, Randy Hayes. No, sir, thank you, good night. Thank you, Randy. And tonight, we start with, where did I put it? Deputy Mayor Kent. Oh, wow. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Just a couple of brief um, comments. I'm so glad to hear that the fishing tournament was a uh, another success. And staff, Joyce, your staff, uh, Robert, if you're still here, they, they do it right. Um, I, I appreciate all of the hard work and effort to make sure that those kids uh, have the best chances possible to, to catch a fish. It is a good wholesome clean family event and i will always support those types of um, activities i love that ike leary who um has the horman bait and tackle goes down there and makes hot dogs for everybody and he'll give them to the adults just like the kids and uh it was really great to hear mr mayor that whoever mentioned it that um, the kids basically every kid received a free fishing pole you know, from um, from attending that event. The next event will be, fishing event will be in June and it will be on the beach. It'll be a, a, a surf fishing tournament. They are all catch and release events. And um, it's just, it's just a, a wonderful time. Also, I agree with Mr. Leary that he, he should be a part of the planning of a bait shop. And Joyce, I'm, my hope is that you will see that he as well should be a part of that planning and reach out to him. I mean, I'm not saying Mr. Leary should have the end all say all, but his two cents 
are valuable, and, and I, I would like to make sure that, that he's heard. That's them. not planned for this year. It's, I think it's been pushed off a year, so it would be the next budget year. Okay, and, and even getting with him, you know, in the near future and, and, and letting him know that information, but also seeing what his ideas are now would not hurt. So I think, I think that's great. Also, whoever came up with this, Lisa, Dame did this. Perfect. Like something as simple as our calendar laid out for us. You know, I mean, that to me receives the award of the month. So thank you. <laughs> For, for that. Ms. Shanahan, is the 26th and 27th, is that whenever we are meeting, that's, that's just next week, is, is that when we are meeting with... Um, the 27th is when we meet with Mr. Price. 26th is... Second, second reading of the uh, referendum agenda. I mean. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, it is, it, is, it is what it is. Because I've got I've got an event welcoming new fifth graders to our school at that time, so you know if I can't be there, I'll leave my comments like Commissioner Selby did. So there we are, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everyone. Have a good, great evening. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, Commissioner Persis. Good evening, everyone. Um, Gail, welcome to Volusia County. We're very happy to have you here. So did I say your name wrong? Robin, why did I say Gail? Sorry, Robin. <laughs> you look like a Gail, I guess you do. Robin, welcome to Ormond Beach. You will love it. I was born and raised here, and you are in a wonderful place. So I, I know you're going to have a great experience with us, and I know you'll help us a great deal. So welcome again. Um, I just my comments tonight. I just I've just noticed recently um, there's been a lot of it seems like a lot of crime happening, little minor petty crime in, in Ormond Beach. We get these reports, and I just want to us to really advise our friends and family and, and just anybody you see to practice smart safety habits. We live in such a beautiful, safe city, but lately the city of Ormond Beach has had a flurry of car break-ins, purse thefts, and home break-ins. Um, most of these crimes really can be thwarted by simply keeping your homes and cars locked. And even if you do lock your car, place purses, money, or anything else of value locked in your trunk. Our police officers work hard to keep us safe, so let's help them and ourselves. And I just want each and every citizen to be safe and enjoy our city and nothing, you know, nothing harmful happens. So with that, I will say good night. Thank you, Commissioner Persis. Commissioner Littleton. Yes, Commissioner Persis. Remember, we have a 9 p.m. routine. And though that happened an hour ago, and we're all late to it, <laughs> let's make sure we do that. Right. Uh, the only thing I want to speak on is I saw a article in The Observer that talked about Riverbend Park having mountain bikes and a like mountain bike trail. And, uh, you know, if a volunteer group wants to clear some land and uh, build up some ramps or the such, and uh, I'm all for it, and I'll support it, and hopefully they contact city staff and it gets pushed through. And uh, with that, I'll say good night. Thank you, Commissioner Littleton. Yeah, the 9 p.m. routine, if anybody hasn't seen the campaign on social media, our PD does a great job promoting going out at nine o'clock and uh, checking all your car doors to make sure they're locked and that you've brought in your weapon from your vehicle or any valuables that you might have in your vehicle. Uh, and I mean, the rest of the city could take a lesson from PD as far as how to use social media effectively. I've heard from so many people in the community who are uh, getting it, it's being hammered in, and when you see it time after time after time, uh, it really, you know, causes you to stumble out at 9 p.m. in your flip-flops and shorts and <laughs> make sure that everything's taken care of. Got to do the 9 p.m. routine. Um, say hey to your neighbors while you're out there. But, Chief, I don't know. I'd like to know who does that so I could uh, send some. Captain Roos, fantastic. Send them some training tips to, to everybody else. The... Uh, the YMCA, Ormond Beach Family YMCA, sent me an email today letting me know that they were chosen by Winn-Dixie for their community bag program. Uh, each bag sold equals a dollar donation to the YMCA. Uh, the bags are attractive, and the Y appreciates your support. Uh, it helps them maintain the work they do in the community. And the community bag program is a great way to continue to support their cause while working to improve the environment by eliminating single-use paper and plastic bags. 
We just had the whole recycling issue over the last month. We learned how terrible those plastic bags are to the uh, MRF facilities, materials recycling facilities. And so something like this would go a long way towards solving some of those, some of those problems. The other thing I wanted to uh, mention is our Ormond Beach Historical Society is celebrating Black History Month. That's like the fourth phone I've heard. And it always takes a while to figure out how to turn it off. But the African Diaspora Experience in Florida, it's a free admission. They start over at Anderson Price at 9.30 in the morning with refreshments, and then the program is at 10 o'clock. This lecture series, uh, it's the Florida Humanities Lecture Series, is fantastic. If you haven't been to one, they're always jam-packed. The speakers are very well informed, and so I'd urge you to uh, try and take advantage of that. There's plenty of free parking behind their building and in the grassy lot and uh, old church parking lot at the corner of Lincoln and North Beach. And uh, just one way that you can go, further your education and celebrate uh, Black, Black History Month in the city of Ormond Beach. And with that, I will say good night. Thank you all.